This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Lord present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. Um, and we also have um, joining us today, we have uh, uh, Superintendent of uh, Schools, uh, Dr. Mike Morris, and we have our uh, Public Health Director for the Town of Amherst, Ms. Emma Dragon. Um, Ms. Dragon will be with us um, until 7 p.m. As many of you, um, I'm sure, are aware, she's been very busy working 24-7 um, setting up and running our vaccine clinics. Um, and I think I heard that we, we, um, you achieved 600 uh, shots in arms so far this week. Um, so um, many thanks to you for your hard work there. And um, we also have Serge uh, Fedorovsky um, assisting us as our technical co-host. Um, and I'm going to take a moment to bring up um, some slides, just a moment. There we go. Are folks uh, seeing that? Um, I'm looking at my panelists to see. Yep, great. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to this open meeting with the Amherst School Committee. Before we get going, I wanna point out that this meeting is being recorded and is being broadcast. Thank you to Amherst Media for your tireless support um, and community engagement. I think this is the second of three uh, times that we'll be working with you this week. We have the full Amherst School Committee here, um, and our plan for this evening is listed here. After a short introduction about the subjects of the meeting, I'll review our basic meeting norms, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris for a brief presentation about the current planning and situation in our schools. Our primary goal for this open meeting is for the school committee to hear from you, the community, and to hear from as many of you as wish to share your thoughts, questions, concerns, or ideas with us. So we will aim to move quickly through these first agenda items and maximize the time for the main purpose, which is open comment from you all. I'll share with you in a moment how you can participate and be heard. Um, but before that, I'd like to uh, share the topics of this open meeting. Tonight's meeting is being hosted by the Amherst School Committee pursuant to Article 8, Section 1 of the Amherst Town Charter. In December, a group of 240 residents submitted a petition requesting this open meeting on 12 subjects related to the Amherst Public Schools during COVID. The 12 requested meeting subjects are bucketed roughly into five bigger topic areas. These are uh, first, the negative impacts of the current distance learning model. And the questions that are listed here are the questions that submitted from the petitioners in the petition to the school committee. Uh, second, the health and safety plans for in-person learning. Third, the metrics and decision framework in the memorandum of agreement with the Amherst Pelham Education Association, otherwise known as the Teachers Union. Fourth, the phasing plan for in-person learning. And fifth, what are the budget impacts and needs in this time? I'll now move on to our shared norms for interaction and engagement during this meeting. When we get to the open comment segment, we ask that you let us know that you'd like to speak by raising your hand. To raise your hand, click on the small hand icon at the bottom of your screen. If you're using your phone to attend this meeting, you can tap star nine to raise your hand. You'll be added to the queue and when it's your turn, we'll call on you and enable you to unmute yourself. If you're using your phone, tap star six to unmute yourself. When called upon, please limit your comments to three minutes. We will have a timer to alert you when you've reached the time limit. If there are multiple people sharing a Zoom attendee login, you may share your three minutes or you may take turns and rename yourself in the participant panel so that we know who's raising their hand the second time. 
If you have a question and prefer to type it rather than to speak, please use the Q&A function to submit your question. Click on the little speech bubbles icon at the bottom of your screen labeled Q&A to type your question. We'll be collecting your submitted questions and we'll shift from public comments to respond to the submitted Q&A questions later in this meeting. Because we want to ensure all those who wish to speak during this meeting are able to do so, we may not get to every question during this open meeting. We will publish next week any questions with responses that we don't get to tonight. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Morris for a brief presentation around spring and early and early planning for fall. Sure. Thank you, Chair McDonald. I'm going to be quite brief because, again, the purpose of tonight's meeting is much more to listen and respond than to present. Um, so really, I'll, I'll try to keep my comments to less than five minutes, and they're mostly going to be focused on an update uh, similar to what I offered on Tuesday night at school committee. So for those of you who watched that, I apologize in advance. Uh, it's going to sound really similar. So last month, the school committee, uh, school committees actually voted a motion to um, plan for a volunteer return to in-person learning. And they asked me to collaborate with the Amherst Palm Education Association on that plan. Uh, we've worked collaboratively with a subcommittee of their executive board. We've met multiple times. Uh, we sent a survey out last week, um, I believe on Friday of last week. Uh, asking staff if they were interested in returning to in-person and whether they would return to in-person learning. Uh, and it was due this afternoon. We haven't compiled all the data from the survey um, just yet. I think it closed, I don't know, an hour or two ago uh, from that. And at that point, uh, once we were able to compile it, we'll have to look to see how many positive responses there were about returning in-person and then figure out what model we might be able to offer, at which point we will contact families if there are seats available at their grade level at their school to see and as best we can match students to educators who are willing to be in person at this moment in time. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, until we get a little further along in the process of understanding who's willing to return to in person, what kind of staffing models we have, there's not a tremendous amount more we can share. Uh, we will be sharing updates on that, but you know, I want the community to know that we've um, worked collaboratively to get a very uh, neutral survey. We wanted to make sure no staff member felt compelled one way or the other. Uh, and now we did have, you know, last time I checked, which was probably at 12 or one o'clock, we had over 400 responses. So we did have good response rate from staff member to complete the survey. Um, there's both, you know, kind of forced binary question of yes, no, but also a comment box, which is critically important because even what I saw so far was, um, you know, uh, some questions as well as a response uh, and some conditionals that we need to consider. So we'll spend the, the better part of the next week going through all those responses, uh, identifying what program uh, we were able to, to work with and then contacting families if there are seats available again in their child's school and grade level uh, to see if they're, what their willingness is to return to in-person learning. Um, and try to build a program as best we can. It's a, it's a unique experiment we have going on in, in this community. Uh, um, and so you know, we appreciate everyone understanding that we wanna make sure that we're doing things in a timely manner, uh, but also making sure that we're able to do it in the way that run, has transportation not be a barrier for families. Um, so once we have the model and know which kids are coming, we need to also work on transportation uh, for families uh, who choose not to provide it. I think the last thing I'll uh, say is that, you know, uh, what we uh, originally thought of as, you know, February, really when we looked at it, uh, because of the break week in February, and, and we want to be collaboratively planning this model with staff who want to be in person, we're looking at that model starting on March 1st. Uh, and we'll, we'll communicate, to the community, communicate to the community as that process goes. But that is our start date, um, the February break. Well, many of us uh, do work February break. Uh, not everybody does, and we want to make sure that we're we're following and all the safety pieces and making sure we're getting the right kids on buses who want transportation and uh, linking them up in the way that we feel like is in everyone's best interest. So I think I got under five minutes, Ms. McDonald, uh, which was my goal for that rather brief update on um, the school committee, uh, the motion that was passed and where we are in terms of the planning and just appreciate everyone's partnership in trying to figure out the, the, the next steps and appreciate everybody who's on this call with a, a strong interest in uh, understanding what the next steps are at a larger level. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to our open comment. Um, and I will say, um, I also see that uh, one question has already come in about the numbers of um, attendees. 
Um, we have about 130 people um, uh, in the attendance here, in addition to those of us that are here on the panel. Um, so I see some hands raised. I think we can start with um, uh, Kate Atkinson. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Kate Atkinson. I want to thank you for listening to me tonight. And I want to thank all of you who probably had no idea what you were getting into joining a school committee before a pandemic hit. I know this isn't easy and none of us have answers. And I don't pretend I have answers. I just want to share what I've seen in my practice. As most of you know, I've been a family doctor taking care of all ages of patients for the past 22 years in the Pioneer Valley. I started out in Belchertown and after a few years moved to start my own practice in Amherst. As a result of that, about half of my families in my practice are from, Bel from Belchertown. Last spring, as the pandemic hit and kids started to work remotely, I started to experience some pretty upsetting things with patients, uh, seeing a lot of patients to huge numbers, um, very stressed and going through a bad time, um, particularly teenage girls. Um, I've never in all of my years of practice admitted five teenage girls to a hospital within a couple months. And I did that last spring. Um, cutting, suicidality, eating disorders, depression. Um, it, uh, exhausting and stressful and scary times for us um, a, as a family doctor. Um, I think you all know this summer there was a reprieve. Um, the weather got better, everybody got out, and it began to feel like, okay, we've got this figured out, it can't be so bad. Um, and then at the end of the summer, I started getting all of the the calls and emails from all of my patients who were teachers, professors and teachers, asking me write, to write letters saying they had to, to work remotely. Um, we decided as a practice not to start writing those because we felt like it was a slippery slope. Um, the fall hit, things seemed okay, and then they got worse again. And by this winter, um, it's been about the worst situation I've ever dealt with as a family doctor. Um, the things I've seen and the stress I've seen have been really horrible. Um, and it's, and it's painful. And I know that, that people are scared and I know that we're trying to think about the needs of everybody, but I've got to tell you, my Belchertown kids are not having this. I'm not seeing this. I do not have one of my kids from Belchertown who's going through this. And they have had this hybrid model up until recently and it just seems to have worked. And I really wanted to share this with you because I want Amherst to look at how Belchertown did it, because as far as I know, they didn't have any outbreaks. Every one of my kids was in school two days a week. Some of the single moms were able to still work two days a week. I mean, it felt like the best of, of both worlds. Um, so I just really want to encourage you, I applaud you for looking at ways to bring kids back in the school. I really hope that we can come up with some kind of hybrid model for the spring, because it's time that we start priority, prioritizing the needs of our kids. Um, they are really suffering at levels that I don't think everybody realizes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna help uh, Allison with the hands and coordination, uh, calling on speakers and whatnot. Um, my apologies if I get your name wrong. Um, so uh, next up is Bill Kaizen. Uh, you have, uh, please unmute yourself uh, and you have three minutes. Can you hear me? Hello, yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Kazin. I'm one of the people who helped organize the petition that brought about this meeting. I did so as the parent of two children at Wildwood because I was concerned about how the district has handled its response to COVID. I wasn't paying enough attention this past summer when the school committee and the teachers union were negotiating the agreement that has kept our schools closed to in-person learning. Other parents were paying attention they said to the school committee that the metric used in this agreement was too low. The school committee didn't listen and 28 new cases per week per 100,000 people was enshrined in the agreement, becoming a fixed and inflexible trigger that has made it impossible for our children to resume in-person school. The school committee now seems to have realized that this was a mistake. The teachers union has not. The teachers union has refused to renegotiate this metric or the agreement which is in effect for the rest of the entire school year, including this spring. Given that UMass has now brought back far more students, 
It's highly unlikely that there will be fewer than 28 new cases per week in the area for the rest of this school year, even with vaccination. This means that unless the teachers union agrees to throw out the old agreement, the vast majority of our children will not return to in-person schooling this year. I've been heartened that the school committee and the teachers union have begun talking to each other again. I am utterly thankful that a small number of teachers are willing to selflessly volunteer to return to in-person teaching to help a small number of children in dire need. I hope that with some teachers back in the building, others will recognize that it's possible for them to return safely as well, and that we might, just maybe, get some in-person schooling for all of our kids before summer break. Nevertheless, I remain extremely concerned, first for our children, second for our district, and third for our town. Every week I hear new st stories from parents about how their kids are suffering from remote learning. Every week I hear about another family pulling their kids from the district. Although our family isn't leaving the district, I would never blame a parent for doing what's best for their family. My family loves Wildwood and all the teachers and staff and in no way wants to see them endangered. Everybody involved is making difficult decisions right now. I'm calling on the school committee tonight to make a commitment to students, families, and residents of the district. Will you, members of the school committee tonight, pledge that all children in the di district who want and need to be back to in-person learning will be back on the first day of school in September 2021? If not, then the consequences for students, families, residents, teachers, and staff may well be dire. Please, school committee, answer this question now or tonight, later, during the Q&A before we lose more families from the district. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so between questions, I'll just pause in case any of the panelists want to respond. Um, uh, so we will go next to uh, Amber Cano Martin. Uh, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hi everyone, um, my name is Amber Cano Martin. Um, I'm a parent of two children. I have a fourth grader at Wildwood um, who's been remote this entire year. And um, I have a little one who's going into kindergarten at Wildwood coming up this fall. Um, so just before I even get into my comment and I, <laughs> I did prepare a comment, but I really am just struck by the wording of this petition. and. And, and quite frankly, I'm not a teacher myself, but it hurt me. <laughs> it really hurt me. Um, you know, first of all, by the allegation that remote learning is hurting our children, that, that's how this starts. Um, remote learning is not hurting my child. <laughs> my child is connecting via remote learning. He's interacting with his peers. He has a wonderful teacher who has innovated to make the classroom a vital learning space the best he can when that's not how he learned to teach. He is working hard, and a lot of our educators are working hard as well. They love our children. They're doing the best they can to create some normalcy for our children in this situation. And to use that kind of language around our educators it is to me shocking and hurtful. So I, I would like to apologize to any educators who read that and what they felt, um, because I felt it too. This is a terrible situation. None of us asked for it. Nobody wanted to be here. But these workers are on the front line day in and day out, trying to serve and take care of our children through it and trying to educate them. Secondly, how is remote learning failing to serve special needs students, low income and BIPOC students in particular? And how does the school system plan to redress the situation? I'd like to rephrase the question. How is remote learning serving special needs students? Question mark, because I don't know. And I'm not sure those who wrote the petition know either. How is it serving low income and BIPOC students? Again, can we ask that question? I don't know. Let's find out. Maybe that could be shared with us. If our priority is to serve those students who are really suffering in remote learning, let's make that be the priority. But I feel that the agenda here is that certain folks would like to get their children back into school. And I get that. I am with you. I have been, I'm a year into this too, just like you all are, okay? Um, but I don't think that writing a petition like this with really antagonistic language towards our educators is the way to go. Um, quite frankly, I'm also opposed to the union busting that's being used to try to get around a legal MOA in order to get educators back in the building when the union already negotiated an agreement. 
So why is our district going to be engaging in union busting by asking for a voluntary return? And how is that voluntary return going to be organized given the fact that our children already are in classrooms, they already have teachers. So is my teacher gonna be taken away from my child to go back in person? Every, each and every one of our educators is being selfless already. It is not a selfless act to expose yourself to COVID and to voluntarily educate in person right now. They're selfless because they're there for our kids, okay? And we have a system that I feel should at least go to the end of the year, and then let's take the summer to plan and return in the fall. And let's do it right, and let's make sure we're safe. And let's make sure as many of us are vaccinated as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Bridget Hines. Please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hi there, good evening. Um, I'm joining tonight as a parent of a ninth grader and also an educator of high school youth. And I just want to briefly speak to the last commenter and say, I really deeply appreciate the work of our educators. I know myself as an educator that many of us are working day and night while being at home with our own children. And that it's incredibly difficult to teach this way because we've got to revamp our pedagogy, our approaches, our ways of engaging youth and um, really learn things all afresh. So I am, um, I deeply sympathize and, um, and have amazing respect for the educators in the community and the work they're doing. But at the same time, I really want to address the losses to high school students related to remote learning. At best, as I understand presently, Amherst High School students aren't scheduled to be back in the building until next fall. This will mean about 18 months out of school for our ninth to 12th graders. And we've been out of in-person learning longer than any other school in Hampshire County. Well, yes, many children are doing okay. And, you know, bless your heart, I'm glad that those are your children. Many other children are not. And high schoolers in particular are really taking a big hit from the current situation. Um, I'm troubled by the academic impacts, which include failure rates for high schoolers um, in nationwide data, nearing 50% for math and English. Um, I'd say my own son this week, like many other ninth graders, had his first math class, um, a full, you know, 80 something minute math class, the first time since last March. That's an awfully long time for someone who's going to depend on knowing algebraic equations and things like that in his future planned career. Um, in environmental science, they never met together to study natural environments. It was an amazing teacher who went above and beyond to um, teach the youth. But if you wanted to be an environmental scientist, you certainly didn't get the base that you would need going forward into college. Um, so while teachers are diligent in trying to engage students pedagogically, I feel like so much is lost on the academic side. On top of which many kids aren't there during the class, even those who are smart enough to check in and sign up for attendance, the rest of the block, they're off doing different things. And if you're at home um, seeing what's on your kid's Instagram and so forth, you know a lot of those things are much more dangerous COVID wise. Than, um, than the things that they'd be doing if they were in a safe, protected environment at school. Developmentally, teenage students need to be independent, competent, and with their peers. And currently, they really don't have the opportunity to do that, being at home with their parents most of the day. It just leads to dynamics that don't line up. As a director of a program for high schoolers who are learning remotely, I've seen more youth partially hospitalized with mental health disorders than in the seven previous years I've held this role. And in Amherst, I hear many stories of high schoolers in crisis seeking help and finding it hard to access. I'm extremely worried about the outcomes for our kids and just would ask that please, when you're formulating these um, reopening plans that you don't put high schoolers at the end of the list. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Um, 
Uh, next up is, is Kim Nadeau, and if, if uh, all speakers could limit their comments to three minutes uh, so that we can hear the most people possible, that would be great. Uh, so please un unmute yourself, um, Ms. Nadeau, and you have three minutes. Uh, hi, this is Serge. It looks like uh, Kim is using an older version of Zoom. Um, I'm, I'm trying to work out exactly what we need to do here, but it, I may need to temporarily promote her to a panelist in order for her to be able to speak. Okay. Let me go ahead and do that right now. And while you're doing that, I'll, I'll note um, that our attendance has increased to approximately 150. I'd just like to hear from my mom, sorry. Okay, Ms. Nadeau, it seems uh, that you are uh, ready to go. It looks like uh, she left the panel. Okay, um, so um, Ms. Nadeau, if um, next time I see your hand raised, we'll, um, we will call on you uh, next. Um, and uh, so in the meantime, we'll go to the, to the next person in the queue. Uh, so that is uh, Jennifer Page. So um, Ms. Page, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer Page. I have a sixth grader at Crocker Farm. Um, I, I have a, a couple, I have a point and a couple of questions. Um, one of the previous speakers mentioned the selfless teachers who may volunteer to return to in-person learning. And I just wanted to say that we shouldn't expect teachers to have to be selfless. Teachers care about their own health and they care about the, the condition and the, the status of their families and that their families thrive as much as the rest of us do. Um, so my two questions are, first, I have talked to families whose kids were not thriving in in-person school pre-pandemic. It was not an ideal situation for them and whose kids are, if not thriving, they are doing better with remote learning. So what, um, what will the school committee, what will the district do to support those families when in-person learning broadly returns? And secondly, what things have worked well about remote learning that can or will be applied to in-person learning? Logistical things like class sizes or group sizes or pedagogical things that have been developed or discovered during, in, uh, during remote learning. What things have we learned that we can apply when in-person learning returns either partially or, uh, or at large? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so, um, and I'll just try and remind the panel if anybody wants to uh, comment or respond to questions, uh, we can do now or later. It's completely up to you. Um, so we will go to, um, so currently there are no more additional hands in the queue. So if anybody wants to uh, Sorry, just, 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 uh, just click, uh, if anybody additionally uh, wants to speak uh, in the meeting, just click your um, uh, raise hand button. I see some going up there, um, but I'll um, go to Dr. Morris now uh, to comment. He had his hand raised and, and then we'll go to the next person in the queue. Yeah, so I'll briefly comment on the two questions that were asked by the previous speaker. So I think um, they're both excellent questions. I think on the first one, you know, um, I think there will be families who are interested in a remote option next year. And that's certainly something that we are considering uh, about how to how to be able to do that. Uh, I'll be honest to say that there's budgetary implications of trying to run parallel systems that way. There certainly were this year and, and there will be next year. And so uh, that is a concern about how, how do we do that and how would the numbers work? So, um, you know, it's something that's on our radar. I don't have anything specific to tell you, except that it's on our radar. We are thinking about it. And there really are financial implications of running uh, multiple systems simultaneously. I think on the second one, there's a tremendous amount. Uh, it's a great question. Again, a uh, tremendous amount of that we're learning uh, from this experience. Uh, we're learning uh, about different instructional modalities, about um, you know, these kind of formats force us to think about creative ways to look at engagement a little differently. And I think there are implications for our in-person instruction as well. Um, you, know, you, you sort of can't, everyone who's been on these Zoom calls, uh, which I'm sure is most people in the audience know that uh, one person like me talking indefinitely on a Zoom call is not an instructional modality. Um, and so I do think we've figured out uh, ways in terms of breakout rooms and how might that be simulated or emulated in in-person uh, experience. We've always done that, but I think it's it's pushed our thinking a little bit uh, on that and our educators are being incredibly creative uh, about that. And I think that will have positive implications when we return in person as well. So I just wanted to comment briefly on those two. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have a, a good queue uh, piling up again. So uh, next up is Michael Ash. Um, please unmute yourself uh, and you have three minutes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we are an Amherst family with uh, one graduate and one current high school student. When our younger son graduates next year, both of our children will have had their entire K-12 education through the Amherst Public Schools. We're grateful for the efforts of teachers, staff, administrators, and the elected committees. We appreciate the challenges that COVID has brought to our entire society with the parents of young children and of children with special needs facing especially great burdens. The national pandemic response represents a policy failure of colossal proportions. But teachers and staff cannot be asked to simply bridge the chasm with their lives and health to make up for the force of the pandemic or for the failed federal and state responses. A report from the UK indicate where, where, where largely education continued, indicates that teacher infection rates were nearly twice those of the general population. That's not peer reviewed. I'm still trying to assess its accuracy. In the current state of the pandemic, see, uh, for example, the New York Times uh, daily reporting on it, and with the arrival of a new, more contagious strain of the virus, it is not possible to reopen the Amherst schools safely for in-person instruction now. Widespread vaccination over the coming months will soon provide a safe path to return to school and work. The prospect of widespread vaccination and a safe resolution later this year makes pressure for a premature and high-risk return to in-person instruction into an especially bad idea. The individual decision to return advocated by the school committee undermines the principle and benefits of collective bargaining about shared working and learning conditions. Would teachers in their early pre-tenure years, for example, feel compelled to come in person? The solicitation of individual volunteers to return also takes deeply unfair advantage of the enormous personal dedication that our educators have to our children. My colleague, Nancy Fulbright at UMass, defines the prisoner of love phenomenon as a willingness to take on untenable costs and risks for people we care for. It's apt in this context and the proposal of a voluntary return is exploitative. We urge the schools committee to stop pressuring the teachers and staff of the Amherst Public Schools into a premature, unsafe return. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, next up is Julian Hines. Uh, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hi there, my name is Julian Hines. I am a resident of Amherst and a ninth grader in Amherst High School, Amherst Regional High School. And I would like to speak to the return of in-person learning. Um, so as many of you know, um, we've been about nine or 10 months now with completely virtual um, learning for our students. And most districts around us have not um, been that far without in-person learning, although I don't believe right now is a safe time to go back. I do believe that there was large periods this fall that could have been accessed to go back. And I also believe that there um, will be time in the future this spring where it is safe to go back. The um, amount of learning loss I've seen within my peers and classmates is absolutely um, notable and is something that I believe the district and the school committee should um, take more seriously um, as they approach this issue. And I would also say that the, um, that the town and the school committee should use verified public health metrics and we should be relying on experts in our community like Dr. Atkinson who just spoke, who's also my doctor, and um, Ms. Dragon who is um, here in the meeting today and not the personal opinions of teachers and um, their unions. So I don't have anything else to say really, but I would like to ask before you all leave if you can promise myself and um, every single one of my peers in all of our grades that the Amherst District serves, um, that we will be able to see each other in person um, sometime this spring, sometime before the 2021-2022 school year. Thank you. Bye. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Elisa Gomez. Uh, please unmute yourself, Elisa, and you have three minutes. Hi, um, I, my name is Elisa. I am the parent of a kindergartner at Helen Elementary, but I am um, speaking today primarily as in my role as a psychologist in Amherst. Um, I specialize in child and adolescent psychology, and um, I see roughly about 20 students um, part of the Amherst Regional Pelham School District. And I just wanted to echo Dr. Kate Atkinson's statements about the effects on the mental health of our community's children. Um, it, it, as I said, I see roughly about 20 students in the school district and um, within the last year, and I would say largely over the last few months during the winter, um, again, in line with what Dr. Atkinson reported, um, I have seen an exponential increase in mental health crises in these kids, um, many of whom were quite high functioning um, prior and who are now just suffering tremendously. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to add those two cents. Um, and uh, I also had a quick question, which is what is the current plan in Massachusetts around teacher vaccination? My understanding is that teachers are not currently eligible. Um, I would love an, if anybody has an explanation as to why and if and when that might change, I would love to know. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Dr. Morris, please feel free to clarify, but as I understand, teachers are in phase two of uh, the vaccination plan for Massachusetts. They are currently slotted uh, after um, those aged 65 to 74. Um, and there has been quite a bit of frustration expressed uh, uh, overall with the pace of vaccinations rolled out in the state, um, generally speaking. Is that is that accurate? Um, yeah, maybe I'll comment uh, for a second, but uh, since Emma's here, um, she's, I'm going to defer to her uh, to describe uh, the state plan, and then maybe I can share uh, a little bit of my own thoughts and advocacy on that. But Emma, if you, um, I don't know if you're able to describe phase, I think it's phase two, group three, but I, I may have the language a little bit. Yeah, sorry, we had a little break-in by the two and a half year old <laughs> trying to step away from bath time. Shenanigans. So, hi, I'm Emma. I'm the new public health director for the town of Amherst. So, in terms of the vaccine rollout in Massachusetts, it is broken out into the three phases. We have just uh, concluded, well, not concluded because it's a rolling phased approach, um, but we have started phase two on February 1st. Uh, and phase two is broken out into those three different um, steps, like Peter said. The first phase, uh, the first step of phase one is those 75 and over. Step two of phase two is those um, 60. I think I can pick it up, Peter, oh, if, if I'm oh. having connection troubles. Sure, go ahead. Oh, looks like Emma's back, perhaps. Oh no. We, we lost you at phase two. Step I don't know two. what happened. <laughs> yeah, so that's those 65 and over with two plus comorbidities. Individuals will have to just attest to those comorbidities. You won't have to bring medical information with you because we certainly understand the privacy um, for protections for health information. And then the third tier of step of phase two is those uh, that are teachers, trade workers, um, public health workers, grocery, uh, transit. Um, and then phase three is the general rollout for the public that don't identify in those areas. Um, currently, there is a large supply chain um, challenge throughout the United States, especially being experienced here in Massachusetts. 
uh, through the, at least the month of February. So that's kind of what has happened to our supply and the pace of vaccines at this time. Um, we are really hopeful with the new administration coming in that the, and President Biden um, going for purchasing more vaccine that we will have more soon. Um, but right now, the timelines that we, I think had all been really eager for uh, in February are not as quick um, as we were in, in originally anticipating. I know that I am really, really looking forward to being able to move through phase two quickly, as, as quick as we can um, when vaccines are here. I know that's why we've made a tremendous effort on the public health side to make local clinics possible, to make this faster with our community because we value everyone in our community. So I, yeah. we don't have a set time right now, but we're all trying our best. Yeah, if I could add to that just briefly, um, cause I think there was uh, to broaden the scope, I just, uh, two things I wanna share and then broaden the scope. So one is just thanks to Emma, who's been a great partner in all of this and, and helping us understand where we are. Um, thanks to our facilities crew and our high school administration, because one of the things that uh, we partnered with the town is because there, some of the days are now happening in the gyms, uh, two gyms at Amherst Regional High School. I mean, Emma, is it fair to say that double the capacity of vaccines given a daily basis? So uh, we think that that's good for, for everyone in the community. And uh, this is not about Emma at all, but I, I do want to express some frustration I heard from the speaker as well, that right now, according to New York Times anyway, there's 24 states or territories where educators are um, able to be vaccinated. Massachusetts is not one of those states. Um, a group of uh, superintendents um, in our area in Hamden, Hampshire and Franklin County wrote a letter advocating for a, an inclusion to be more like New York and other states that have allowed for educators to receive vaccines um, now at the current time. We received a response from Secretary Pizer. Secretary Pizer is the Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth. Um, did not agree with our assessment of the need for vaccines in this timely manner for educators. I think that's a, a factual recounting of his letter. Um, I can editorialize, but I'll choose not to in this forum. Um, and none of that, I just wanna be clear, I know I've said it, none of that has to do with Emma. Emma does not have all power to disregard uh, the advice that she's given and the guidance that comes from the state. Um, so I want to be really clear, none of the frustration is directed towards you, Emma, or the health department or the town at all. You've been wonderful partners in this. But it is a sense, uh, I do have a sense of frustration. And I think in the age of social media, as people cross the border to New York, and uh, it's pretty easy to do that in a virtual context these days and see selfies of educators getting getting immunized, it's, it's been a very uncomfortable moment. And I know many of our educators uh, feel very frustrated and I agree with them about that. And um, it's, I think on the agenda for the next Tuesday's school committee meeting is uh, this topic. I see there's another school member with a hand up. I, I probably, uh, I'll just put the soapbox down and let other people um, perhaps yes, jump on it. It's good, sir. Yes, I just wanted to confirm that it is on the agenda and I'm currently working on a statement um, that would be probably echoing many of your sentiments and sentiments of the caller. Thank you. Okay, so just a time check. We have about uh, eight people currently in the speaker queue. So um, Ms. McDonald, uh, or nine, eight or nine. Um, so why don't we try and clear out that queue in the next 25 minutes or so. Um, and then um, and then we can switch to rotating between the, uh, the questions that are starting to come in through the chat and some of the questions that were submitted in the survey. And uh, Ms. McDonald, you can confirm, but uh, I believe we've committed that if there's a question that's submitted and we don't get an opportunity to answer it in this forum, that it'll be answered in a published q and Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I see that there's a question in the queue, um, in the typed queue that um, is asking whether we're going to answer the questions. And just to restate what Mr. Demling just said, we want to give priority to the speakers um, so that we hear from everybody who wishes to speak to us. Um, and then we'll start cycling through the questions that are being submitted right now in the um, Ted Q&A, there's about um, 10 or 12 that are in there as well. Um, one of them is, are we going to answer the question? So yes. Um, and if we if we don't get to them, um, we will be publishing afterward the questions and responses to those that we do not get to tonight. Um, and this also includes the questions. I think we had about 39 questions um, submitted um, through the online form um, through yesterday. 
So those will also be cycled through when we get to that portion of the meeting. Okay, great. So uh, without further ado, next uh, speaker up is uh, Carlo De La Picciola. Um, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Thank you, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, okay, correct pronunciation is De La Picciola. Thanks. <laughs> It's a hard one, I know. Uh, I want to uh, thank you for uh, having this meeting and listening to us. Um, I'm the parent of two children in the Amherst Regional Schools. One is uh, a sixth grader in Wildwood and another is a 10th grader in the high school. Um, needless to say, of course, neither of them has been inside a classroom since the middle of last March when the schools closed. Um, I don't need to get into the details, but um, as you can imagine, uh, it's been very difficult for them and for our entire family. I'm working on the assumption that they will in fact return to the classroom for at least some number of days before the end of the 2020-2021 school year, particularly in light of the fact that at some point vaccines will reach all school faculty and staff, the sooner the better. Uh, my question is, um, whether or not I can, I can get from the school committee a hard commitment to a full-time return of all the children who wish to be in the classroom, meaning normal school operations, potentially with a little bit of social distancing or whatever is necessary, by the beginning of fall 2021, barring any unforeseen complications, of course. I've, I'm, really wanting to see a very concrete statement um, of a strong commitment of, of the type, as soon as every teacher is vaccinated, that's when we start opening everything up. And by the time we're at fall 2021, every single child will be who wishes to be in school and have in-person instruction five days a week will be able to do so. Um, I have to say we've been extremely happy with, with the, the school system. We are proud residents of Amherst. Uh, everyone uh, we know in other regions of the country and as well as outside the country um, consider us to be a, a wonderful district. So this is, this is a moment of um, a little bit of embarrassment actually because uh, I have to explain to people who, who do have their children going back to the school that, you know, it hasn't happened yet for us, we still don't know, et cetera. And to be honest, if we can't get a strong commitment for fall 2021, we, we just, we don't want to do this, but we have to look at other options. I, I, my number one job in life at this point is to be an advocate for my children. That comes above everything else. And I don't want to do that. So I'm really, really hoping that within the next week or two, I, I, I see a statement that's strong enough that, that makes me want to stick around and, and keep my kids in the school system. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Um, I'll just take an opportunity to respond to that. And then you know, obviously any other panelists, um, I'll just say for my part, I'm, I'm just one person on the committee, so I can't speak for the committee. Um, it's, it's certainly my, um, my, my desire. Um, and, and, and my, my goal that, that any student who wants full-time in-person learning in the fall is, is able to have that. Um, it, it, it requires us to, to discuss and plan that as a committee and with the superintendent. Um, right now, um, the, the plate is overflowing for, uh, in terms of what the superintendent needs to be focused on uh, and what the school committee is focused on, um, both in terms of the voluntary return of staff um, uh, and and also the budget, um, which is a pretty serious situation at both the region and Amherst. In addition to other initiatives that are also going on that we are trying to engage the community on, like a change in start time. Um, and so, I, I pragmatically speaking, I it's I don't think that it would be responsible uh, as as an individual school committee member. I can only speak for myself uh, to say tonight I commit that this will happen because I can't I don't I I can't you know I don't have that control. Um, but it's certainly a very high priority for the school committee. We've talked about this at recent meetings to be focused on what is possible in the fall and to, as soon as we are able to clarify um, what will be available. Um, I know that's not a satisfying answer right now, but that's, that's you know, honestly the best that I can 
provide. Um, Dr. Morris or Chair McDonald, I don't know if you have anything to, to add to that. Yeah, I was going to I was going to step in because I, I see that there's also multiple questions on this and, and an earlier speaker asked a, a similar question. And so there's there's multiple um, ways at this and requests for a pledge. And I, I hope I, I will restate a little bit what Mr. Emling just said. Um, I think I think the most that we can say is that we are absolutely committed to getting as many students in person as as want to. Um, we can't make a guarantee that that's going to happen because as, as we learned in the last year, every you know everything can change and um, things uh, we have new learnings and new um, obstacles along the way. Um, I think that I and um, I'm not alone, I don't believe on the committee are, are really committed to making um, making changes so that we can get there. Um, and short of a commitment, I, I, that's pr probably as close as we can go at that point. I will also make note that um, we do have a quorum of another school committee here that has not been called to order. Um, so I will just make note that we can speak freely about our elementary schools um, and we'll, um, when it comes to our secondary schools, we will listen um, and make notes, but we are, are limited in our ability to respond at that one. Dr. Morris, I don't know if you want anything, wanted to add anything. Um, I, I know that um, I mentioned uh, that Ms. Dragon um, needs to leave shortly. And there, there is a question in the um, in the Q and A that is related specifically to vaccine clinics. Um, I can read that out. This is coming from um, Ms. Bridget Hines. I heard that communities have flexibility in the vaccine schedule. Can we prioritize teachers and vaccinations in town? If not, could we work with UMass or the town to get all of our teachers vaccinated on the first days of their place on phase schedule? I think that's a great question um, and certainly one that I know lots of people have been hearing about. Um, un unfortunately, individual towns and health departments, we are not giving guidance that we are allowed to change the metrics. If we change metrics, we could lose our ability to continue to provide vaccination sites um, so we unfortunately are following the guidance that is given to us. Um, I, I don't make the, didn't make the phases, um, but I certainly want to at least have a clinic um, for our community following the guidance that we have right now, even if it's challenging with its rollout. Um, but I remain committed to that. Okay, thank you. So uh, next up in the queue is Ryan McCarthy. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Ability to continue to provide that. Okay, Ryan, feel free to go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. All right, so uh, my name is Ryan McCarthy and I'm an Amherst, uh, an Amherst resident with a five and nine year old at Crocker Farm. I'm a public school teacher and a union member and I've been teaching in person in Hampshire County since September. I come from a family of public school teachers, all of which teach in Massachusetts and all three of them are currently working in schools with in-person learning. My two public, uh, the two public schools that my parents recently retired from in Massachusetts uh, currently offer in-person learning. And the overwhelming majority of schools in Hampshire County and Massachusetts, as we're all well aware of, are offering uh, um, in-person learning uh, right, right now. Uh, having been intimately involved in the process of public schools, uh, of a public school navigating reopening during the pandemic, I know firsthand that it can be done safely and effectively. My personal experience with teaching during the pandemic has been somewhat unremarkable uh, in the sense that we have a safety plan in place that everyone follows, and I pretty much just teach like I normally do. Um, there have been no instances of COVID spreading in our school. Our students and staff are safe and the students are benefiting from the far superior experience of learning in, uh, in person. For my students that struggled with remote learning, struggled uh, with social, social isolation and have less than ideal home environments, in-person learning has been a step towards normal that they so desperately needed. 
it pains me to see how appreciative my students are to be learning uh, in the classroom and how disengaged and frustrated my own children are with the uh, extended remote learning. The unresolved, of, the unresolved issue of in-person learning in our district has my family feeling very unsure about what school will look like in Amherst for the rest of this year and the next year as well. We are very happy with the education that our children are receiving at Crocker Farm, but extended remote learning has negatively impacted our children to the extent that we are uh, looking into options outside of Amherst next year. Uh, as a public school teacher, I'm not asking anyone to do anything that I'm not doing myself. I'm just asking uh, everyone to do what's best for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, next up is uh, a user uh, by the name of GW. GW, uh, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hello, um, thank you for holding this meeting and for allowing participants to voice their questions and opinions. Um, I'd like to start by addressing one of the comments that was made early on um, <clears throat> regarding the language used in the petition um, seeming to be disrespectful of teachers. And I'd like to um, indicate that uh, I am one of the people who um, signed the, the request for this meeting to happen. And I have the utmost respect for the individual educators who are teaching our children in the Amherst Regional Public Schools. Um, what I am extremely concerned about and uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say angry about is the, the decision that was codified in the memorandum of agreement regarding how the metrics were going to be used to decide if return to school would be taking place this year or not. Um, the reason I'm using my initials is because I have two children. Uh, we, we live in Amherst. I have two children in the elementary schools. I had to pull one out in fall because that child was unable to learn on a computer setting at all. A month later, we were able to get a confirmed diagnosis of ADHD for that child. By that point, we had already had to find an outdoor school for that child. And in fact, we had to remortgage our home to be able to afford that. And we are still in financial straits as a result of putting that child through that school, but it has been a lifesaver for her and I am not using that term hyperbolically. Um, I am an educator and I also research education. I research teaching and learning. And I will tell you that the child that we have at home learning online is A, not learning, B, going through uh, an extreme change in his behavior and so much so that we have had to return to, um, well, rather begin um, therapy for him. He had been doing some social behavioral therapy uh, group, group work on weekends, but things have gotten so bad with him that I am now having to attend um, individual therapy sessions with him again, a cost that we are bearing, not only in terms of dollars, but in terms of the time that I have to take away from work and that he has to take away from school time in order to do that, because we have to drive there, do the session, and then drive back. His teachers have been incredibly supportive. In fact, his teachers um, have, have really been doing all they can to work with him. I, I value and respect and am super grateful to his teachers. It's not the teachers. It's the methods, it's the, the, the setting in which we're trying to educate children. It is not working. And the, the idea that we um, might maybe return some people to, to school in March, at the beginning of March, that is too little too late. I'm glad to hear that there is forward progress, but I personally would like to beg you to try to turn up the heat on this discussion and try to think about the effects that really are happening to our children that are going to last much longer than this school year. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments, GW. Uh, next up is uh, Lara Drucker. Uh, Lara, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. And if all speakers could uh, keep it to three minutes, that would be great. Um, so we can get to as many people as possible. Thank you. 
I'll also note that there's about 170 people in attendance at this point. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Drocker. Uh, from August, parents have been asking for really simple things, a science-based approach, something that's a little more nimble, a little more creative. This is not anti-teacher or anti-union. When I feel most discouraged by this entire situation, it's in the fact that we can't, as a community, agree to these basic principles. This doesn't mean we start school tomorrow or we go to school when it's unsafe or that we even agree to a final outcome. But why can't we agree to these basic principles? Why are we teaching our children that we can't agree to these things? Many things can be true in this situation. I'm happy to hear that some kids are thriving, but we have real data that shows attendance is not good for all students in our community. The doctors who have spoken have confirmed that mental health, health is suffering in our community. COVID is real and scary. There's a risk of COVID in everything we do outside of our homes. I am glad to hear, and I've always been glad, that our district has prioritized letting parents that want to keep their kids home for whatever reason, remote, can do so. And if I understand correctly, teachers and staff who need to be remote are being accommodated. And if that is not correct, it should be. And I see Dr. Moore shaking his head. And in an ideal world, no one would be putting ourselves at risk and we would all have been vaccinated yesterday. But we also have to be realistic that Amherst is an outlier. Others in Hampshire County, as we just heard, have been or are currently in person, including neighboring towns in our county. I think we could all agree that all teachers and child care workers should be getting vaccinated now. And I personally have been writing and calling our elected officials about this, and we should all be doing this no matter what side of this that we are sitting on. We should be able to speak up without being told we are anti-teacher. My mom is in her 34th year as an elementary school teacher in Maryland. Please, my fellow community members, can we stop with the name calling and putting people into groups and camps without any evidence to support it? No one is union busting. Other districts have successfully renegotiated contracts just this year around COVID, including Boston Public Schools, only months after going to court. <laughs> Again, Amherst is an outlier. We don't like, so let's just put that on the table. I personally think it would be more pragmatic, to, pragmatic just to renegotiate the contract, but that's been taken off the table. So now we're here with this volunteer approach. I appreciate the creativity and I really hope we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Deborah Leonard. Uh, Deb, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, my, my, I just really have a, a simple question actually. I've been doing my best to follow this and, and seeing the vaccines come online over the course of the end of last year, I became very hopeful that we would be moving forward to um, uh, have some reopening of in-person learning in Amherst. Um, and I've, I've read the MOA and recognize that uh, both, all parties agreed to it. So it is a legally binding document. And the way I read the part about the Joint Labor Management Safety Committee is that in the advent of a vaccine becoming widely available, the JLMSC will discuss its impact on the educational model being used and will make a recommendation to the district and the APA and the bargaining will proceed from there. So beyond renegotiating, it seems to me there is a mechanism for negotiating in-person learning for where we will be very soon. And I just don't understand why that's not happening. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Morris. Yep, and I'll ask Emma to confirm something and then I, I know she's got to get on her way. So I'll use it as a segue to get one more, one more uh, piece of information from Emma and I know she has to depart. So, you know, I think, uh, and this is where I'm going to ask Emma to confirm. So, you know, in general, when, when we're talking about vaccination, the first shot is then followed roughly a month later-ish, depending on which vaccine it is, with the second shot, with the, the vaccines that are currently available. And then, Emma, can you tell me how many weeks after that it's, it's perceived or believed that um, kind of the vaccination process is more or less complete? Yeah, so for Pfizer, it's 21 days later that you get your second dose of vaccine. Um, you start to build those antibodies after 
that injection. And then it's undetermined really a, probably about a month or two later that you start to have maximum effects from the vaccine administration. Uh, with Moderna, it's the second injection four weeks later, 28 days later, so a little bit longer. Um, certainly, I, I know I'm hopeful for, for the other vaccines coming on board, like the Johnson & Johnson, that might be only one injection um, to help kind of speed this process along for all of us. Yeah, so thank more you, to come. Yeah. And so what I was going to say after Emma, and then I really am going to make sure Emma goes because I know she's she's five minutes beyond her hard stop, which uh, I want to be respectful of her time, is that one of the challenges we have and one of the reasons I've been pushing and other superintendents have been pushing so, so strongly for teachers to be on the vaccination um, list right now is if you think about the, the first shot, the second shot, that month gap, and then perhaps another month after in terms of uh, filling it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not a short process in terms of... Um, that, that you described. And so if we get too late into the spring before teachers names um, are called up on the list, it's really going to be a push to see whether this school year uh, from a back, if we, if we want staff to be vaccinated um, or some staff want to be vaccinated before they return, I think it's really questionable whether that, you know, is possible with the current timeline the state has. And that's really why, you know, superintendents, like I'm not trying to claim glory for this. Other superintendents are, are doing the same thing, not just in Western Mass, but the North Shore group um, started it in um, North Shore, Boston, because that process or to get to the place where the vaccines have taken root more fully, and um, I don't have the right language, but Emma does, is, is not a, an immediate process when you get a shot and the next day um, the immunity is there. And so it definitely increases, you know, over time. It's not that the first shot's a waste of time, but if we're talking about building immunity, it's a longer process and um, our school year ends in June. And so, you know, that's really a lot of the advocacy around that um, to, to get our educators in sooner is because of the process as you described it, Emma. So again, Emma can't solve our problem. Uh, I wanna be really clear. And I know I said that before, but other people may have not heard that. I really don't want people calling Emma tomorrow and saying, you know, please, sneak in the educators. I mean, that's great, but Emma's got a lot of things on her plate right now too. Uh, and I've already had that conversation with Emma, right? And Emma rightfully said no. Um, but but on a serious note, it, it is a process that takes a while and the longer into the spring it goes until we get to the phase two, step three, the more I'm concerned that some of the benefits around immunity, um, the timeline's not gonna be working in our favor. Uh, and that's why I feel so much urgency at this point. Um, as many, many of my colleagues do as well. And I know this will be a topic on school committee next week. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to speak for the school committee and they'll have that to talk about. But um, thanks, Emma. And I'm going to make sure you get off this call and, and get to the other things that you have to get to. And thanks for all of your work. Thank you very much for joining us. Emma. Thank you for having me. Take care, everybody. Uh, okay, and, and uh, Dr. Morris or Ms. McDonald, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, as to the speaker's question about impact of uh, vaccinations in MOA and JLMSC. I think it's correct that it, um, MOA says that it should be brought up to, for discussion and the JLMSC should make a recommendation if there's, if it desires to, but it does not require a renegotiation of the, of the MOA. Okay. That is um, uh, next up is Heather Sheldon. Um, Heather, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hi there. Uh, my name is Heather Sheldon. And I am speaking on behalf of the board of the Amherst Pelham Special Education Parent Advisory Council. These comments are very similar to comments we have made at multiple school committee meetings since our school buildings closed last school year. But it's clear uh, from some of the comments tonight that they need to be said again. Our schools have been closed to in-person instruction with teachers and specialists, regardless of individual education plans that call for life changing services like occupational therapy that can only be meaningfully delivered in person for almost a year now. This has serious long-term implications for many of our students. Virtual learning means no learning for a great many of our students designated to be in phase one. We have heard leaders in our community ask for creative solutions, and we wanna make sure that the use of our buildings remains on the list of creative solutions. Much effort has been put into making our buildings more robust to the virus. For a variety of reasons, schools remain a safe haven for many of our students, and there are significant barriers to providing instruction elsewhere and through different means 
that are impacting whether many of our students are getting an education or the services that, are, that they are entitled to at all. While our comments above are centered on students with significant disabilities, we know that students have a broad spectrum of abilities and all learn in different ways. Just as robust learning must be an option this year, in-person learning needs to be an option for all of our students as well, to the greatest extent possible. And I don't think we have found that balance in Amherst. Yes, there are risks to providing in-person instruction, but there are also significant risks to not doing so as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sheldon. Uh, next up is Lara Wall. Lara, uh, please unmute yourself and you have to Hi there, can you all hear me? Yep. Great, thank you for so much for having this. Um, I have a daughter, Zuleika, who is in eighth grade, and I have a daughter at Crocker Farm who is in sixth grade. We recently have decided to do a homeschool hybrid plan because my children, um, they were in Montessori school till fifth grade. So they love learning. They are so motivated, they are brilliant. When they went to public school, they were straight A students. My eighth grader, it's just been heartbreaking. She is so disengaged and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, but education is so important to our family. And to see these kids just turn off. So now what we're doing, because they, they love peers. Um, I don't know if you know much about Montessori, but it's the belief that a child learns academically socially and emotionally so in order to still have social and emotional we're doing a hybrid plan where for the first half of the day they're doing their online classes and then for the last half of the day i'm taking on the role as their teacher their teachers have been incredible this is not about our hardworking educators who have had to adapt i'm sure it's not easy for anybody their teacher, Mr. Hughes, over in sixth grade at Crocker Farm, has been amazing at working with me so that they can go back in person. The hybrid plan that I'm doing is only until they can be back in person. So we're staying right along with the curriculum. But this has been so hard for our family. So thank you for doing everything you can, because I can tell you, as a Montessori mom who has poured thousands of dollars into our children's education, to be met with this when there's so many kids in private schools that are back there are so many children in other districts that are back i can't believe that we can go bowling you know and be around people bowling but we can't have our children in school so i'm very passionate about this i'm very angry about this and i appreciate everything our teachers and the administration is doing thank you for hearing my comments thank you uh, next up is Ellen Boucher. Uh, Ellen, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Thanks. So um, I'm the parent of a Wildwood kindergartner and second grader, and I'm also the proud daughter of public school teachers. And I want to start by expressing my deep appreciation for the work that the school committee and our teachers and staff are doing at this very difficult time. I think it's great that Emma Dragon was here because it's striking to me how significantly the scientific understanding of COVID transmission and risk has evolved since the creation of the MOA. And with, with the majority of recent studies, as well as the CDC showing that in-school transmission rates are very low if the proper precautions are taken. So I think it's more important than ever for the school committee and the APEA to be making decisions according to the evolving scientific evidence when evalu evaluating how to enable children to return to in-person learning. And my, my second thing is a question. I'd like to know more about how the district is measuring the impact of remote learning on our students and their families. Um, given that some of the more significant potential emotional effects, um, things like suicidal ideation, increased bedwetting, depression, you know, effects that people like Dr. Atkinson started the meeting by talking about, these are things that students and parents might not feel able or comfortable disclosing on a survey. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Morris. Yeah, I'll just speak briefly that we are working um, on a screening tool that's anonymous to gather some of some qualitative and quantitative data uh, about some of the issues that were cited by the last speaker. Um, 
you know, we have a tool that's been used other places that's being evaluated, uh, particularly focused on middle school, high school students, uh, but not exclusively um, because we, we share those concerns and want to gather. We have a lot of anecdotal data, but I think the speaker wisely noted it's it's hard to have a, a survey that's potentially tied um, to an individual and really more we're looking more at the aggregate. Uh, about how kids are doing. So more soon on that, but we're, I want to recognize that that's a, a, a really good suggestion. It's something we're actively working on. And we had, uh, Dr. Brady is our student services um, director. Obed, who was an intern, did some research into that and, and he did some presentations with us. So some of you may remember him. Um, so it's something we're actively exploring and working on because we want to make sure we're getting um, not just the individual stories, but a cross section of how students are experiencing things and what supports they need. Okay, next up is Nina M. Uh, Nina, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Uh, Peter, I think we, I think there's another person ahead. Uh, Michael, I believe. Oh, my apologies. Um, Michael, uh, Michael, who's in my, yeah, my apologies, do not see that. Uh, Michael, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hi, this is Michael Huston. Thank you. Uh, I was on the school board for nine years, the chair of the regional and also the chair of the Pelham Elementary School Board for nine years. Um, one of the things I want to point out, first of all, is that I really am upset about this binary equation between teachers versus kids. And while, and the teachers have, there, there's no mystery to the teachers that the kids are suffering. Kids, they know that. And I want to point out that the teachers have kids themselves in the schools. And so, this idea that we keep repeating about the suffering of the, of the children and the mental health issues, which are real, is somehow lost on the teachers. It is not lost on the teachers. The teachers know this, and they wanna be back in the classroom as much as anybody wants them back in the classroom. So that's the first thing. I feel like the tone that has been set is of teachers versus kids, as opposed to what somebody else mentioned earlier, is that the problem is with the state and the federal response, that our teachers are not being vaccinated, that we have not been given the enough PPEs, that the kinds of money that are required to make our school buildings safe have not necessarily been provided. And I haven't heard that loud and clear from the school committee saying that is where the problem lay. It's not the problem with the teachers. I understand these difficulties. My kids went through school. I had my kids went to K through 12 through Amherst schools, Pelham schools. They're not there now. Uh, and I, I know a lot of these teachers and I know how committed they are. Um, the other thing is I'm not so sure we're such an outlier. San Francisco teachers are not back and, the, and they're being sued and their school committee is standing behind them. They're being sued by, I believe, the city and, the, and maybe the state. Chicago teachers are not back. There's a reason for that. And it's because they're also scared. They're scared for their families. They're scared for their children. So we're not such an outlier. Um, and I have one question here uh, about the MOU. My understanding is that it was a number of around 28 or 30 based on the combination of two or three counties. And my, if that is true, then the numbers for per 100,000 are now over 100 per those three counties. What I have not heard from the school committee is everybody wants to change the MOU, but what do you want to change it to? What's the number you're proposing? Uh, they proposed, or the, uh, the, the Education Association, the union, or however that came about, proposed one number, I assume based on some science, and now we're saying we need to revisit that. So what's the science for the new number if we're still looking at numbers? So um, that's all I wanna share right now. I appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, I've sat on that side of the table. I know how hard it is. These are really difficult times. Um, this is not a problem that the teachers have created. It's not a problem that any of us have created and we're trying to muddle our way through. Thank you. But, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Um, I'll just respond briefly a couple things. One, uh, if you haven't heard, uh, you say you not, haven't heard strong enough from the school committee about where the real responsibility for this lies. Um, we've said it a few, a few times recently at school committee meetings, although people don't watch those things all the time, but I'll say it again right here. 
you know, Donald Trump and his criminal gang are number one with a bullet in terms of responsibility for the pain, suffering, and death in this in this country and in our state. That's that's very clear. His misinformation campaign is dereliction of duty. That's that that, and it's not even close. You know, and in my opinion number two is is uh, is is the the mismanagement, the bungling of the the vaccine rollout uh, and the general logistics from Governor Baker. Um, you know, and, and it leaves it, it. You're absolutely correct that it, it puts an undue amount of pressure and responsibility on school committees and unions to, to figure this out. And it's happening all over the country. Um, you know, as far as like what, you know, what what specific me- number do we want if, if we're so anxious to talk about metrics? You know, the, the request since October from the school committee has ha- hasn't been we want you to agree to a level. It's please just sit down and talk to us about it. Now that's and that's been the real frustration in the in the MOA process uh, for me is that we're not saying it has to be X Y Z. We're saying so much has happened, uh, and 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 we need to talk about it. Would you please just sit down and talk to us about it, about the metrics in the MOA? And so far, there's been an unwillingness to do so, and that's where the frustration for that lies. Um, but I also want to say, just so it doesn't come across t- too negative, um, you know, I I personally hold that very real frustration that continues over the unwillingness to sit down and just talk to us about the metrics with a very real gratitude for the recent collaboration on this voluntary return. Uh, It would not have gone as smoothly or as supportively of staff were it not for the hard work and sincere collaboration of of union leadership. Um, And I honestly think they deserve a lot of public positive credit for that. Um, You know, so I, I Personally, I hold those two feelings at, at, at the same time, and it, it's difficult. But but I'm glad you raised the issue about what we're dealing with. Um, so uh, next up is Mar- Maria Luisa Di Stefano. Um, please unmute yourself, and you have three minutes. Uh, sorry, I, I think I think I see Nina's name above that. Uh, is that okay? I'm sorry. I'm I must be having a little scrolling issue here. Uh, Nina. My apologies. Um, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Hi, um, thank you. I'm Nina. I have a third grader in Wildwood and his teacher is incredible. And even though he is telling me now that he hates school because he hates being on a computer, um, he I'm, I'm endlessly impressed with how well the school is handling remote learning for those who are attending. Um, So I wanna thank you all and I can't imagine how hard it is to be in your position right now. Um, But it's very difficult for me to watch um, as districts around us and across the country are opening to in-person and hybrid learning and countless professional studies have shown transmission of the virus happens in homes and rarely in schools that implement appropriate measures. Um, I feel it is so important as the previous speaker who is a teacher in the school and it's so important for our residents to understand that that San Francisco Chicago is not Amherst and that Amherst is is an outlier and I want to speak a a little bit to um to 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 what was just spoken about the frustration of of the school committee working with the union Um, And as an outsider watching this process and talking to friends who are who are teachers in the union, um, I'm told endlessly about a a long history of mistrust between the union and the district and that I think goes back way, you know, be way longer than this current, obviously, school committee. And I understand and I sympathize with teachers, particularly BIPOC teachers, some of whom may have lost faith in a system that they feel has not taken care of their needs and protected their bodies and who may harbor really deep, understandable distrust of their employers. And it seems plausible to me that this history of mistrust is actually at the root of, of of what Mr. Demling just addressed as a frustration of why we're not able to renegotiate an MOA that is so clearly outdated to to look at what could happen when it's safe to make that happen and to get the kids who need it into schools. And my question is really how 
are you going to move forward to address this at a systemic level? Um, it seems to me that this doesn't have to be happening in our town, that other districts are doing so much better and other districts are collaborating so much better with their teachers unions. And my question is, will the district and the union commit to some kind of process of outside evaluation and remediation to address whatever this underlying issue is, what these issues are that are creating what appears from my side to be a dysfunction in these parties that have the same goal in mind, which is really to serve our children. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, Ms. Ms. McDonald, I, I think it's just briefly to respond to part of that. I think we had mentioned at one of our co-meetings with the APA um, about um, potentially at some point doing a restorative process. Uh, and there was, I, I think, uh, agreement expressed um, uh, about that general that general notion. Yes, that's um, uh, we've been talking about that, and we um, uh, we opted to meet informally at first and not um, through a restorative process. I think um, at, at the in January um, and made good progress. And I think as we as we continue later into the spring, um, it is something that we um, will want to do. I, I want to just I, a couple of speakers have asked about this, and I see some questions in the in the in the typed queue regarding the metrics and the MOA. And just to answer clarification right now, and I, I think Mr. Jemling mentioned this, there's no negotiation happening um, with the union on the MOA. The MOA is settled. Um, it's it's what we're uh, operating under. Um, and there's no negotiations or um, offers at this point because um, uh, both parties need to agree to um, to reopen negotiations on on that MOA in, in order for that to go forward. So I just want to make that point of clarification. I will also say um, that the current MOA expires at the end of June and does not continue beyond that. I think there's been some uh, question about that as well. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I just want to also appreciate the comments from the speaker about trust. And um, you know, while I agree that like rebuilding and having a strong foundation of trust is better and more productive in the long term, I think with the with the the recent collaboration, the very positive collaboration on the volunteer return has shown that you know we we don't have to necessarily trust each other in order to work together effectively. You know, it's it's obviously ideally it to, for everyone to trust each other, but um, you know, we've what 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 has been achieved with the voluntary return is is was no small feat. Um, required some back and forth, some real discussions, um, and those were had even even though all the trust has not been reestablished. So we should we should certainly work on that. I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't, um, but it's 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 also not a necessary precondition to to practical. Um, efforts forward. Um, next, so next up is, uh, unless, Serge, I have the cue wrong again, is uh, Christiane Healy? You know? Okay, my, my cue is just, um, no, okay, I'm sorry. Mar Maria Luisa uh, Di Stefano. I I'll get this right. Sorry about my, my continued uh, error on that. Um, Maria Luisa, uh, you have uh, three minutes. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Hi, thank you. Thank you so, so much, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Luisa Di Stefano. Um, my comments are based on um, my work as a, as a college professor with expertise in bilingual and dual language education and as a parent of a multilingual child enrolled in the dual language coming on this program uh, for River. Um, first of all, I would like to praise the work of all um, educators, staff, and leaders, and especially in the coming on this program. That's you know my, my ex the experience that I have with the, the district specifically who have been um, able to strategically maintain the language allocation plan and the focus on equity and social justice. Um, in the 15 years of experience that I have in this field, I, I never seen anything like this done online, you know, remotely in terms of language development. Um, at the same time, um, I understand that maintaining that the 50-50 exposure to both English and Spanish um, and the access to those uh, resources that would allow all students to succeed in such a program is, is difficult in a remote uh, learning model. Um, so I have one main point. Um, I uh, believe that if, if we work together, we can find a plan 
that, that for example, would allow students to go back in person at least for partial time in the late spring would they use, for example, outside facilities and structures that um, I remember that were purchased uh, by the district um, at the beginning of the school year um, and um, ensuring, you know, that all educators, staff and students will be safe inside and outside the building. Um, so I don't know if that will be, uh, um, I would like, you know, to ask if that is something that could be considered uh, or if is that impossible because obviously it's not uh, part of the MOU is not included in the MOU. Um, uh, in the second point, I really wanted to call to unity and collaboration, um, avoiding the toxic conversation and, and the use of some derogatory remarks that inflame, inflame the, the discourse instead of focusing on, on, on a common solution. Um, I just want to encourage all of us to engage in a collaborative approach. Um, we are, um, as, uh, this has been said uh, all the times, we are in a unique uh, community, very diverse group with uh, families representing different languages, races, ethnicities, classes, genders, sexual orientations, abilities, etc. So we, we all as a community need to be united and work for a solution that will um, support both families and educators and staff. Um, so we need to unite, heal, and engage in an explicit anti-bias approach for our schools. Um, thank you so much for uh, your attention. Thank you. Um, okay, and now is Christian Healy. Okay, <laughs> uh, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Christiana Healy. I'm the mother of um, two Fort River kids, um, one in third grade, one in fourth grade. Um, and first of all, thank you to everyone who's working hard on behalf of our children. And they're really many people. Um, their teachers are wonderful and really hardworking and they make this remote experience um, actually very strong. I think you can probably hear my kids in the background. Um, as much as they can, it's, and I, I do teach online at UMass as well, so I recognize some of the challenges that they are facing, and I'm impressed with how well they're doing. Um, but at the same time, we are providing a lot of support for our kids, my husband and I. We've shifted our work around, and we're fortunate that we can shift our work, where one of us is at home and near our kids at all times, listening in, um, and especially for one of um, our kids, we are providing a lot of support, similar to that of a paraeducator. So reminding when it's time to switch, checking on homework. I mean, there's just so much that we're doing, and we're lucky that we can. And I just think about all the families that are out there, the parents who cannot support their children the same way, and where the kids then are much less able um, to really get much out of remote learning. So earlier, um, a couple of speakers were, were sort of speaking, you know, were kind of doubting that there is, has to be strong motivation to go back to in-person learning. But I think there really is. And we are one of the, you know, fortunate families that we can provide support, but many others can't. Um, and I especially think they're about the, you know, special needs children um, who, yes, who cannot access the curriculum in the same way when it's a flat computer screen with some faces on there. Plus all the, you know, we're, many of us, I think, are, are familiar with the Zoom fatigue and the social interactions just is not the same. And so for kids that have problem with social communication, for example, this is a rough environment um, or those who are easily distracted and need frequent reminders to stay on task. It's just not the same, no matter how wonderful the teachers are. And that I'm, we're also foster parents. We do short-term um, hotline kind of work. And I am so, I, you know, I'm, I mean, my, my experience is certainly limited. And yet I still, I do have experience um, with that really vulnerable group. And those parents, you know, when, when kids enter um, the foster system, you know, it's often because of neglect and those parents cannot support those children. And it's hard for foster parents to then support those children. So, you know, I come back to that question about, um, sorry, about, you know, if so many other schools around Amherst can do it, they can be open safely, really, why can't we? It's just, I come back to that, why can't we? And then you know, the comparison to Chicago and San Francisco is just not realistic because those are huge cities and they also in states that have much bigger problems. Um, so yes, thank you for all your work. Thank you. 
Uh, next up is Zach Early. All right, I got it right. Zach, uh, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, I'm a parent of, uh, uh, like Mike, uh, a first grader and a seventh grader in the district. Um, uh, and we moved here about five and a half years ago uh, intent and living uh, here in Amherst because of the schools. And we love Amherst schools so much that um, a couple years ago, I'm, I actually teach now at Fort River and am and, and proud to teach in Amherst. Um, I've been in education for 23 years. Um, uh, and, and part of that time also, I, I led a group of people who wrote online courses at the University of Missouri. And so I've, I've seen online and I've done, I've been in a lot of classrooms and I've, I've been in, I've been in person and um, frankly, this is not working. Um, I think people have pointed out a lot of the, the shortcomings of distance learning. Um, I, I like to say we're, we're working twice as hard for half the result. Um, so obviously we're all working really hard um, but the results aren't there. Um, and, and I mean those socially, emotionally, um, academically, um, really in all ways. And, and, and I not only see it in my own students, but I see it um, in my own children. Um, and it, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, my, uh, we have even gotten to the point where, because we're both professionals, um, I've had, we've had to bring my mother in um, from several states away. Um, sort of putting her at risk um, and in some ways putting our own family at risk um, just to bring her to help support um, my first grader. Um, it's, it's what's most frustrating is that the, the data since schools have been opened to in-person overwhelmingly um, uh, demonstrates that we can do this safely. I think in particular a community like this where our numbers are actually um, have generally been quite low um, but Schools don't tend to be the drivers of, of higher uh, uh, numbers. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, you know, the, it, it's frustrating that we're not opening. Um, and then I, you know, to echo some of the other things that have been said, to, to be able to open the spring to take advantage of, of outdoor opportunities. And, and there's just, I just feel like we're leaving a lot on the table. Um, it's gotten to the point where, you know, despite all that love for this district and being committed to working here and my kids attending. Um, in March, we'll be looking at school choice uh, if, if our kids can't be in person, particularly in the fall. Um, and that just, that kills me a little bit. Um, that, you know, that I, I've been an educator for so long and my mom was an educator and, and I really believe in public schools and, um, and it's tough for us to consider that we may have to get, look elsewhere. Um, so I would really encourage school committee, um, my own union, to work together um, to finding a way to open the spring, um, you know, in, in, and even in the fall. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. Uh, next up is Bennett. Uh, Bennett, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Two layers of unmuting had to happen there. Sorry about that. Um, my name's Bennett Hazlip. I have two kids in the schools. They're not doing great. Along with Carlo, who spoke earlier, I'm embarrassed too. I'm embarrassed that we're begging for some signs that maybe, hopefully, if we ask nicely, we could talk about being back in school in fall. Um, since the MOA was signed in, last, in, in late summer, we now have real studies from places like Duke by actual scientists from many states and districts using many different models. And there's real consensus now. Schools that have undertaken the right processes and procedures and protocols can do this successfully without meaningfully contributing to the spread of the virus, even without the vaccine. They are doing this successfully. The CDC says they are. Multiple reliable articles in the media say so. I'm embarrassed that the science is not influencing our approach in Amherst now not next fall. The union's so-called consistency in sticking to the MOA is not a virtue when you're hanging on to an agreement that was made in the fog of war last summer over this virus. Knowing this can be safe 
and haven't made real significant investments to make it safe, we should be finding ways to get kids and teachers back in school. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next up is Desmond Fitzgibbon. Please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, excellent. Um, so the, uh, this is, I'm speaking for Desmond Fitzgibbon and Catherine Corson. We are parents of a sixth grader at Wildswood and a seventh grader at the middle school. Um, these are amazing schools with incredible educators broadly defined. And I want parents who are not yet in the district to know this. And we as a community really need to do a better job of getting this knowledge out. I'm an educator myself and um, have been so impressed with the work that has gone into adapting pedagogical approaches for the virtual environment, building a sense of community and keeping kids engaged. Even remotely, my children's teachers remain critical anchors and sources of joy and inspiration in their lives. It's important to note that while there are challenges, there are also things about remote learning that are working well for some children and for some even better than in person. But I would like to appeal for unity today, for working together in how we approach this incredible difficult challenge. We as a community of parents, educators, and administrators need to work together across our differences to come up with solutions that do not pressure educators, that ensure the health and safety of those that choose to return, and most importantly, prioritize the children most in need for a return to in-person education. This is an incredibly difficult time, and we are facing a colossal failure of leadership and social services in our country but schools and educators specifically cannot possibly solve every problem. We need a community focus on what's best for all of our students, not a divisive battle that attacks the union and pressures educators. We need to be lobbying the state and the federal level for more social services, for prioritizing teachers for vaccines, for the same PPE protections and provisions for educators that health professionals have, for housing and, and food security, for increased funding for schools that are doing much more than usual at these times, and for taking the community closure precautions that the CDC recommends before opening schools. The mental health toll that others have talked about is important to recognize and redress. All the more reason to do the careful planning in collaboration with the union and school staff to ensure that the students who are the highest priority as identified by educators and beginning with the side letters already on the table to return to a safe, healthy and mentally supportive space. So we have some questions. Can you tell us what the in-person school will look like for returning children? How different will it be from what our children are used to? Will successful, what will it successful in-person look like, learning look like? How will teachers and other staff be supported in making this relatively rapid transition? How will you decide which children get to go back? Then related, many of us who want to remain remote are concerned about how this move will affect our children. How will a partial return to in-person learning affect the current classroom placements and pedagogical approaches being used? Will remote learners have new teachers be with new students or have to go to new schools? Will teachers be required to teach in person and remote simultaneously? How will the transition affect students who have established connections with their teachers? How will you ensure the positive relationships that they've built with their peers and teachers already this year are not disrupted? This is of deep concern to many whose children are thriving in remote learning. Thank you for hosting the meeting and the dedication that you've all um, shown to making this the best possible decision that you can at this incredibly difficult time. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Morris, um, some of those questions that were raised, uh, we got, so there's a lot of questions related to um, what will volunteer, what will in-person learning look like um, uh, with, when the volunteer um, process um, plays out um, both for students and staff who are remote and students and staff who are in person. A lot of questions about what, what will the supports be? Um, I'm sure you saw them in the, in the survey input. I, I'm gonna give you a moment to, to kind of collect your thoughts on that because it's, it's, it's one of the biggest topics in the survey um, while we go to the last um, speaker in our, currently in our queue. Um, and maybe that will be our point where we'll, we'll transition and try and knock off some of the uh, Q&A um, questions that have been submitted in the chat. 
and then maybe bounce back and forth um, from there. So um, next up for speakers is uh, Alicia Reed. Uh, Alicia, please unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, thank you. So I'm Alicia Reed and uh, I'm married to Ryan McCarthy. Uh, as Ryan described us a little bit earlier, he has been teaching in person in a Hampshire County Public School since September and he'll be there tomorrow, as will three of his siblings in Eastern Massachusetts. The thing that has been most frustrating to me and that I've heard stated multiple times tonight is the bizarre amorous bubble that we seem to be living in in which statements are made that, well, we're in a pandemic and schools just can't be open right now. Except schools really are open, locally, statewide, throughout New England, today and without vaccines. I'll note that Biden's nomination for Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, came from Connecticut just next door, where he successfully had all but two districts open in some form by December. When DESE collected data in November, 70% of districts in Massachusetts had hybrid or in-person models for the majority of their students, not just a handful, but the majority of their students. Our district was in the bottom 30% of the state running a primarily remote model. I also contacted every single school committee in Hampshire County and can therefore say definitively that we have had the fewest days with students in buildings of any district in the county. In the fall, we closed on October 23rd, while 17 out of the 18 other Hampshire County towns kept children in buildings until November 20th, and many persisted into December. That 18th town has now opened in January for K through 12. And most towns, including Hadley, just right next door, 10 minutes away, have now brought students back following the holiday spike. When people just shrug and say, well, we're in a pandemic, we need to be clear that the Amherst Palm District is in a situation of its own making, in which our children alone are not receiving what has been offered in the other 18 towns in Hampshire County. Some feel quite good about our remote status. As a spouse of a teacher who will be in his public high school tomorrow, quite safely and without a vaccine, I disagree. I also wanna note that I feel fortunate to have found a remote learning center in an Amherst daycare that my kindergartner now attends. I have no concerns about her safety. She is happy there. I don't know how else it can be more clear that people can be together in congregate settings very safely without vaccines and they will be doing it today, tomorrow and until the teachers are fully vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. So, uh, so right now there are uh, no hands raised in the queue. Um, please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to speak and you haven't spoken yet. Um, so we'll take this opportunity then, given that the, the queue is, uh, is at zero at the moment, uh, to transition to bump, um, hitting some of the survey questions and some of the, the Q&A questions. Um, so Dr. Morris, um, there, there were, uh, you heard a couple speakers ago ask about um, implementation questions about the volunteer plan return. Um, I, I know you said that um, a lot of those details haven't been finalized yet because we uh, need to establish um, the, uh, the staffing. Uh, some of the themes in the survey questions from about the volunteer return were about how is this going to change or disrupt my student who chooses to uh, remain remote? Um, and um, what support will there be both for students and for staff in making this kind of transition? So um, if you could speak to that. Sure. Um, so I think the, the, one of the key questions I want to start with, it's a little, it was asked by the same speaker, but I think it's a really important one is um, what does high quality, you know, teaching and learning look like when there are restrictions in place in terms of mask wearing and six feet. And, you know, the easiest way to answer that question is we saw fantastic teaching for the set. And it was only seven days for the seven days we were in person in October, I visited the schools and um, our, our staff did an outstanding job. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of positive reports about the kids' reaction to that and um, how they, they were learning and um, things were going very smoothly uh, from that perspective. So, you know, I, I want to start that we, we're not starting at zero. We don't have any, not that we don't have any examples of successful models that have worked. I think on the broader point, um, it's the same actually conundrum that we faced even as we were phasing in uh, potentially the, you know, later phases of the rollout plan. So, you know, at kindergarten and first grade for the elementary level, we did kind of put students who at that point, their parents indicated, parents, guardians indicated they want to be in person with teachers who were slated to be in person. Um, we didn't do that at, at 
grades two to six because it was later on. And so I think uh, to the point that was made, we, there, it's possible that there'd be some shifting of staff of, to match students and families who want their children, um, families who want their children in person and staff who volunteer to be in person. Uh, we would try to minimize that as much as possible, but I want to be transparent that that would have happened under the old plan uh, as we phased in more grade levels, and it would certainly be possible to phase in a new plan. Uh, and that's really when we get later into the year and talk about, well, is there another opportunity? We do, I think there is some critical point at which, you know, we're in April or May. It's hard at that point to think of um, a switch where at a semester, we're just about ending the first semester now, right? At the elementary level, report cards are coming. The semester just flipped at the secondary schools. Um, that's a point in the year that that happens. It happens sometimes routinely just because teachers have to go out. They're either, um, sometimes they're expecting, you know, child, things like that. And, and we were well accustomed to making those transitions and supporting students through those transitions with our talented counseling staff. Um, so I want to acknowledge that, that that's a real concern that I've heard from families. Um, and the goal would be to match uh, learners and staff uh, with the learning modality as best we can on that front and communicate ahead of time. And that's one of the reasons we did push off. You know, originally we were thinking of uh, the volunteer return happening the month of February, we pushed it to the beginning of March because we wanted to have an entry plan that was supportive of staff and students to be able to have time to, to work that out. In terms of staff returning um, to the buildings, uh, we did build in some time before they would return for you know uh, more trainings with nursing staff and other staff around uh, if they need refreshers on PPE, we did all this in the fall, but it's been a really long time for, for staff members. So we'd want to make sure that we provide them space and time, uh, both pedagogically, but also from a health and safety perspective and a protocol perspective to feel comfortable and confident uh, about the systems we have in place. Um, and I think um, this is really, I want to acknowledge the, the concerns because this is really hard and very difficult um, year. And, you know, I really want to appreciate the speakers for being able to express their viewpoints uh, very clearly. And I think this is one of these situations, uh, I'm sorry, I'm riffing Mr. Demling and Ms. McDonald, I hope it's okay, where uh, lots of people can be right, right? And I think lots of perspectives can be shared that are opposed uh, and, you know, I just appreciate, you know, people uh, being able to share them tonight and the way that they were shared, because um, it's really been productive for me to hear all the different voices tonight. Um, it's a little different hearing voices um, in this setting versus, you know, reading emails, which are really helpful, but, but feel a little bit different uh, from my perspective. So um, I'll let you get back to the Q&A, but I, I wanted to note that. Okay, um, so I'm going to try and thematically batch <laughs> some of the uh, input questions uh, from both the survey and, and the Q&A. Um, I, I would also encourage, if there's any panelist who is, is seeing some questions that they would like highlighted that I'm, I'm not getting to, um, just just raise your hand and you can uh, you know, do the same thing. Um, so, uh, and, and if anybody is um, still would like to speak uh, who is at attending, again, just please raise your hand and we'll uh, rotate back to the queue. Um, so uh, with regards to um, this fall, Dr. Morris, um, uh, so there's four, four related questions here. I'll, I'll, I'll pretty much ask you the same thing. So similar topic about, you know, you've, you've, you've said in general terms uh, about how, um, about what we, what we know and what we know can't, can't say at this time, but, you know, I'll just read the questions anyway. Uh, so Carlo de la Pichola asks, will the school committee and APEA commit that 100% of the kids, elementary, middle, and high school, who want or need to go back to in-person learning will be back on day one of the fall 2021 semester full-time. Um, the second question in this theme from Lee Jennings, will ARPS guarantee that instruction will be in-person starting in late August, September for the 2021-2022 school year? Um, also from Deb Leonard, um, I would like to know when we will know if fall of 2021 will have an in-person component most private school deadline application deadlines are already passed. I need to know when I um, need to make alternative plans for my rising senior in high school. Uh, and then finally from Kathleen Doherty, can we expect a decision regarding the fall soon so that we have time to enroll in private schools if desired? Um, so Dr. Marcer or any of the panel. At this point, I would defer to the school committee if they wanna comment on that one. I think there's some other questions um, I think well equipped to answer, but I think um, since it was some of these were addressed directly to the school committee, I'll 
I'll defer to you all for now. Um, I believe, uh, can you restate the last question, Mr. Devlin? Yeah, uh, can we expect a decision regarding the fall soon yeah. so that we have time to enroll in private schools? They're, they're all basically asking the same thing, which is like, uh, when, when, will, when will parents know about the fall and can we now or soon, is the school, does the school committee, and one of them says in the APA, uh, commit to uh, in-person and to what extent for the fall? Yeah, I, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier tonight. I think um, we, are, we are in the midst of working on the planning for, for the fall. Um, we, we did have a conversation about the calendar specifically earlier. Um, I can't remember the specific date, um, but uh, the, um, we looked and, and talked briefly about sort of the implications of moving to start earlier to enable um, outdoor learning and other sort of um, creative options for that. We opted against that given the many other sort of impacts and um, both in terms of the uh, summer school as well as cost um, for and for in facilities, et cetera. So we are um, we are not moving significantly earlier, um, but we haven't looked at the specific calendar dates. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, um, while we are committed to um, to maximizing in person learning, that hasn't changed since the beginning of the school you know, since last summer. Um, we, as we, as we've learned this year, the both the pandemic and our learnings and understanding of the pandemic and our nature of schooling changes um, and evolves. We can't make a hard and fast 100% commitment that all all children will be um, enabled to have in person learning if they so choose. That's what we're working toward. We can sort of state that that is our goal. Um, but, um, and I think somebody had asked sort of what are some of the things that, you know, prevent us from making that commitment today. Um, number one is we, we don't know the nature of where the pandemic will be and the, and, um, the extent to which um, not just teachers, but also students and families will be vaccinated. Um, and um, we also have a, our current agreements with all of our unions. Um, I think all of our unions are expiring at the um, end of June. Um, so, um, there's there's some uncertainty surrounding that, as well as um, uh, sorry, I think those are the, the biggest ones. Oh, budget. <laughs> that's that's not um, any minor, but we um, that doesn't impact in person learning, but it impacts what that what school will look like um, in some cases. Um, and and just to plug for future school committee meetings, we do have some upcoming um, budget presentations that um, both at the Amherst level and the other school committees. I don't know if that um, answered all of those questions there. Um. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just, I know this is not a satisfying answer to parents right now because um, if, um, if if I was a parent of a, of a student next year, I would have the exact same question, which is, you know, when are we going to know the answer to these questions? Because people have to make decisions. Um, and, and um, I mean, I would just say again, personally, just speaking for myself on the school committee, these are answers that I would like to, um, I would like for our committee to answer as soon as we are able. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a priority for us to, to identify and figure that out um, and, and um, you know, to, be, to, to, to work out the things that we need to work out in order to be able to uh, commit to that. Um, Ms. McDonald, you, you mentioned um, budget, uh, there are, uh, Quite a few questions in the uh, survey about uh, budget impact, uh, so I'll, I'll I'll try and read and, and summarize uh, those in batch. Some of them are technical about what what can we use with regards to federal funds. Some are more um, general about um, impact to remote learning and whatnot. Um, so from Ina uh, Ganguly Prokopovich, how will the loss of students to other districts, charter schools, and private schools combined with level funding impact the district next year? What will be the number of positions cut, both staff and faculty? Who gets let go first and why? How much money is lost per student who leave the district? What programs will be cut? I'm just gonna read these in batch uh, because a lot of them are related and then people can reply to one or more points as, as uh, any panelist has, has desired. Um, so the next one of the four or five is uh, from Laura Drucker. Is the district being strategic about positioning itself in terms of getting the funds 
that are about to start flowing from the federal government. My understanding is that these funds are earmarked for districts with in-person learning. How will that impact our ability to get this support? And longer term, how can we position ourselves effectively to advocate for funds to cover losses from this time period? How can parents be the most effective allies? Um, a related comment from Lauren Mills. What local, state, fed, federal, and or emergency monies will the district make available to be used for Amherst Elementary students and most struggling students that do not fall under special education IEPs or 504 plans to provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring so that, so that this no longer falls in parents or does not get provided because parents lack personal resources. Um, again, related from uh, Nina Menken, what is ARPS doing to ensure that we are able to get all federal funds that are coming through for schools? Do we have the development infrastructure to do that? Is it true that we need to be in person to receive most of that funding? Thank you. Uh, and finally from Sarah Goff, has the economic impact of students leaving the district been evaluated? If students do not return, what will this translate into budgetary changes and what would be cut? So a lot about uh, try, act, trying to access federal funds, how our model impacts that and um, losing students, what, what does that mean in terms of loss of services and cuts um, for any of our panel? Dr. Morris. Yeah, so, so it, hard to track all of those questions, but I'll do my best. <laughs> and the ones I miss, please remind me because they're all really good questions and, and um, definitely in my wheelhouse to answer. So um, the state, the chapter 70 funds, which are the state funds that come to districts, um, they're based on October 1 enrollment. So, um, you know, multiple school committees and shared an enrollment update uh, that showed a significant decline in, in our student population beyond what would have been expected with, you know, just year to year variants. And so that is having an impact on our budget for next year. Um, at all three, well, I'll just speak to region and Amherst, uh, the two districts that um, are represented for students in Amherst, uh, this will be a very difficult budget year for multiple reasons, not only that, but it does contribute to that because it does affect how much how the funds that flow from our state government to our local schools. Um, you know, at our regional schools, two nights ago, I shared that the budget cuts we're looking at um, at the seven through 12 uh, are about a million dollars. Um, and we estimate about 16 positions uh, will be lost um, to, as well as other items that are not personnel uh, to make up that gap. And so our budget situation is very serious and it is impacted on, by the number of students who um, attend our district. At the elementary, we, we also have a significant budget gap. It's not quite as significant, um, but we're, um, that process plays out a little bit later than the regional schools um, for bureaucratic regions, but it just plays out a little bit later. So we'll get to that uh, by the end of the month in terms of um, some, some rough estimates and the regional schools plays out sooner. Uh, we don't have to be in person to access federal funds. Um, so I know that was a question. Uh, we do have um, the, it's called ESSER II, which are um, the second CARES Act that was um, voted, um, I think the last week in December. Um, and that's really intended to be used for, it's not just like free cash, it's intended to be used for COVID related pieces of back to school. So we do have uh, access to that to support us next year if we do need to purchase more PPE. Um, if there are COVID related needs that we had to have, you know, it could be used uh, for, if we do have a remote learning program next year, it could be used for some of the pretty expensive programs we purchased this year. Um, so we do have that funding source, but it doesn't really supplement the operational budget. It's much more focused on uh, supporting COVID related expenses um, for our schools. There's some other ones in there I missed, Mr. Demling. I'm sorry, when you were reeling them off, I wasn't able to gather all of them. I'm trying to think of critical ones that I missed there. Um, yeah, so if anybody else on the panel notices questions that are missed, please oh. speak up. I'm, I'm trying to uh, queue up the next batch for you. As sure. Um, one that I know was asked, um, so I want to answer is that, um, you know, uh, it was, well, I think it was asked, but I'll just say it anyway, is that there's been some questions sometimes from community members. Could some of the federal funds be like direct payments to families for the impact? Um, and Holyoke explored that and it was deemed an, in, uh, an expense that could not be used. In other words, we can't uh, quote unquote pay parents uh, for their support during risk remote learning. None of that is to suggest that parents aren't taking on and parents, guardians and caretakers aren't taking on an amazingly large role. I just wanna share my appreciation right now, but I know that's a question that's come up a couple of times from a couple of different people. Um, so even if it wasn't in the comments explicitly tonight, I did wanna address that because um, it is a question that I've gotten um, on four or five occasions uh, from different individuals this year. 
Ms. McDonald, right. were there other ones that, um, sorry, Mr. Demling, that, that I missed? No, I think you've got, I think you've got um, all of them. I scribbled, was scribbling as Mr. Demling was speaking, so um, <laughs> I think you covered it all. I just want to also note, because um, folks have asked, um, that we are at about 110 attendees at this point. Right. I, I think the high, water, high watermark that I noticed was 168 um, a little while ago. Um, so um, a couple of uh, detailed questions in the Q&A that, that I think I know the answer to. Will the results of the survey uh, Q&A uh, that we're publishing be made publicly available? I think the answer is yes. Um, I'm seeing nodding heads there. Uh, is the Comandantes program at risk of being cut? No, uh, it is not. Um, and I see nodding heads from Dr. Morris. Um, so a couple of detailed ones there. Um, next kind of thematic batch is about lessons learned from, um, from our current model. Um, so, uh, so there's three here, um, one from Jennifer Page. What has worked well about remote learning that can be applied to in-person learning? Um, second from Tony Cunningham, what is working well in remote learning? What new pedagogical approaches are being used in the classroom? Uh, third from Will Snyder, um, it's a longer comment. Um, this past 12 months has been the biggest shakeup the schools have experienced in their normal practices, perhaps ever. We've all been surprised that some things have gone so well. Teachers, parents, and students have all been resourceful and creative. What have we learned about teaching and learning that we can apply as we move forward, particularly about teaching in school and remotely on a uh, more regular, perhaps permanent basis. So I think um, I tried to respond to a number of those. Uh, I think when Ms. Page asked uh, questions during the um, first part of the um, the meeting, I think another thing, and and uh, you know, it wasn't explicitly asked, but in terms of what we learned, um, I think we've learned about you know that start times are a topic worth exploring. Um, you know, and, you know, I'm not going to belabor that because that's um, tangentially related to the topic of the night. Uh, I don't think if we didn't have an adjusted COVID schedule at the secondary school, we necessarily would feel the urgency uh, to pursue this topic this year. Um, it's, it would probably be more likely, you know, just roll the way we've always rolled. So that's one aspect. I think, you know, for some students, because I do want to note this um, in, it's in the question and, and kind of a comment there, um, we I don't want to... Um, not acknowledge that many people came here tonight and I've heard from numerous people throughout the year how challenging remote, the remote environment is and I've also heard throughout the year that for some students coming to school is a very stressful experience for a whole host of reasons um, and that the remote environment is working very effectively in terms of reducing stress and some anxiety that can come for some students attending school in person. So I think we wouldn't have known that because typically students who don't come to our schools were homeschooled. So we, would, we wouldn't necessarily have that same type of feedback loop. Um, so I think that's been really effective. I think our teacher's use of technology, our staff member, our educator's use of technology is never going to go back, right? It's not just that people um, teach uh, online this year, just in general, how we organize ourselves, how we organize Google Classroom, even with younger students or Seesaw at the primary grade levels. Um, I think that's been effective. I will say that even for our youngest students, their own technology use has surpassed what we would have anticipated uh, in the past. And so we are having active conversations about how can we, what's the right way to integrate technology as we eventually do move back to in-person instruction. Um, so there's an awful lot we've learned. And, you know, thankfully my school committee, and I think Ms. Spitzer, I believe was the one who came up with the ideas. And one of my professional goals this year is to report back on what did we learn this year? Uh, what, what are the instructional and larger um, educational learnings that we've had and how can we improve our educational system instead of quote unquote going back to what we used to do? How do we actually move forward uh, with the learning that we've had kind of in this you know, forced experiment um, that everyone is having around the world because of COVID? So you know, I appreciate that forward thinking by the school committee and look forward to being able to report on that um, in the spring. Yes, Ms. Spitzer. I think I'd also just like to recognize the amazing amount of effort that's gone into um, feeding our families and students, especially. I think that's something that I've been um, particularly impressed by our district's response. So I don't, I know it depends on some emergency federal funds that we've been able to um, feed so many folks, but um, 
I think it's highlighted the need in our community and also our ability to meet it creatively and with, you know, tremendous effort both by staff and volunteers. So I just want to recognize that. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Bitzer. Just to put a quantified, I believe we're in the neighborhood of 150,000 meals served since March 17th, um, which is um, all free, uh, all for, for students uh, in their district. And, and we continue to hear, even if there's like, you know, the curriculum day, you know, we always hear about it because families just want to know, is the food, you know, pickup still happening? And um, our custodial staff, our uh, food service volunteer, or food service staff, excuse me, have done a, a fantastic job working with our, uh, the families and really supporting our larger community. Cause it's not just about the kids. It's actually has such a large impact on families in general, uh, about food scarcity. So I appreciate you mentioning that. So uh, speaking of the amazingness of our various staff, uh, this next, next uh, batch of questions has an opportunity for that. Um, so with regards to uh, facility safety and staff safety, um, a few questions um, there. Um, Sarah Goff asks, are teachers fully informed about the eff efficacy of N95 masks plus goggles or face shields? Can the school district provide these? Uh, Laura Jocker asks, can Mr. Harrington <laughs> speak to the HVAC updates? Uh, and PPE available. And Zach Early asks, can someone speak to the safety of the buildings? Um, so general questions there about um, the PPE and facilities status and safety. Yeah, I'll take it. I don't, I don't want to put Mr. Harrington, uh, he can jump in, but uh, he knows more than me, but I also uh, want to keep his hat straight. Um, so uh, in terms of um, where we have, we have um, thousands, I think 64,000 KN95 masks that have all been rated by, you know, and verified by CDC uh, to be above the 95% threshold uh, in terms of how well they work. Um, so they're on hand. Uh, we do have uh, goggles, face shields. Um, um, we have uh, we have a, we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on PPE, high quality PPE. So, you know, our, our nursing staff have been leaders in that. I want to thank them uh, to Mr. Denling's point for organizing that um, and making sure that our staff have um, the highest quality products uh, in terms of PPE. In terms of ventilation, um, our facility staff have been working constantly throughout the year to both test um, the spaces where students and staff would be in and, and make changes and fixes when needed and retest. Uh, at this point, um, our, our instructional spaces um, pretty much uniformly have met the four air changes per hour threshold. Many are quite above, quite above that. Many have made it without an air purifier, but we have committed to have air purifiers in every room that are the HEPA air purifiers with the UV light, um, disinfecting light. Um, and so we feel very, I feel very good. I think we collectively at the district level feel very good in terms of school safety. Uh, many of our surrounding districts don't have the same standards around ventilation. Um, I know of some that are two, three, um, but you know, our, our rooms are, are well above that threshold. Um, we, we committed to not having classes in rooms, like for instance, there's a couple in the middle school uh, that don't have windows so that, you know, naturally people can open, open windows and get additional ventilation. And even on cold days, um, you know, cracking the window a bit, uh, our heating system keeps up uh, and maintains that so people can have that access, have access to that. So in general, I feel like, you know, the HVAC, the facilities team is, and the nursing team's done a great job. So in terms of PPE, uh, ventilation, um, you know, nursing staff, um, all of those pieces, protocols around that. Uh, I feel very comfortable and confident with the work of our team. Mr. Harrington, if I missed anything, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, the, the few things I would add are like, okay. it's a building specific, like Wildwood in, in Fort River, the opening of the quads kind of, I mean, we doubled our capacity for HVAC in those areas, that sort of thing. And then um, I, I, I don't think there's ever been a point in the existence of our buildings where, where every single component has been analyzed to the, the, the extent that it has. And I, I just want to kind of echo the sentiment that the facilities department has worked beyond over time and especially our HVAC specialists who, uh, I mean, the, there's one person like that and, and it's Doug Pion. So we, we are definitely in good hands. Yeah, I mean, I would really quickly echo that, that in addition to the amazing work that the facilities staff have done this year, it's really a testament to their work over the years leading up to this year that has put us in this, in this position, right? You don't, you don't have old buildings that, that test so well with the ACH if you're not meticulously uh, maintaining them 
and knowledgeably with with you know a, a, a discipline and a work ethic and it's it's that then that's you know that's department wide uh, about about how people have just put the work in day in day out years before the pandemic even hit us to even put us in this position so many other districts have so few rooms that have that ACH level of four or above and and you know we're we're very fortunate even with the age of our buildings um, to be where we're at so it's I, I find that amazing um, so um, next batch of thematic questions. And I, I, again, I'll just uh, remind uh, attendees, uh, if you just click, there's no queue right now. So if, if you click raise hand, uh, you can speak um, and, and I'll call on you next. Um, next next batch of questions uh, is about uh, BIPOC students, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, so a few comments and questions here from the survey uh, from Mary Clays. Uh, we've seen a drop in attendance among BIPOC students which is enhancing resource gaps now and will only increase them when we return. What's the plan for handling this now? What are the plans for handling this upon return to school buildings? I'm gonna read these all in succession and then y'all can cogitate and respond to them. Um, uh, next, uh, from Nina Menken. Uh, the attendance data we saw in the fall was very disturbing, showing a huge discrepancy between attendance of white families of means who can work from home who showed an increase in attendance from in-person schooling and lower income families with a large majority BIPOC representation who showed dramatic absenteeism. What are the current numbers? Does the district have personal advocates assigned to children who are falling through the cracks in this way? What is the plan to assess and address learning loss? Please include my entire comment along with my question rather than just posting these last questions. I feel strongly that our concerns and voices need to be heard without editing. And thank you for your difficult and dedicated work. Um, yeah, so those were the uh, the three comments there. Yeah, so uh, I could speak to those. So uh, in terms of the attendance data, we've seen an improvement in the attendance data as it relates to the, the discrepancies that we noticed in the fall. Um, I think that's primarily due to two reasons. One is that each of our schools has attendance teams uh, that they review data every week and make proactive uh, problem solving phone calls, not in terms of, you know, uh, threats or anything that you know you may read online that districts have been doing, but they're really framed to how to solve problems, how to work with families. And the second has been the expansion of our distance learning centers um, has had a huge impact. Uh, Marta Guevara, or, um, who works in the family center, leads the family center. Dr. Guevara has worked to identify students who have been struggling the most with attendance issues. Um, and uh, we now have upwards, I believe we're up to 60 students um, K to eight now and distance learning center at the middle school and another 15 or 16. Um, that's the intensive needs distance learning center at the high school. So we have seen um, a significant difference in the data. I want to note that it's not, it's still not even, it's still not um, equal. Um, it resembles uh, some of the attendance data that we've had pre COVID. And so it is something that we're actively concerned about. Um, it's, it's a topic, a weekly topic of, conversation again at the schools. It's a topic of conversation in my work with principals and, you know, our staff have done, I think, a fabulous job of outreach. And, you know, I want to be something I've said before, and I want to say it again, a lot of times there's an assumption that, you know, the lack of um, or the attendance challenges that any student has is based on, you know, devices and internet access. Our IS team's done a great job and that that no longer is the primary barrier, but that's not actually the only barrier towards attendance. Some of that is supervision. Um, some of that is, um, quite honestly, the house of uh, size of home, how many students would be trying to study. Uh, and some of that's about the challenges that some of our students are facing with distance learning in general, that the, the modality is not effective for them. Um, and, you know, I think we heard some of that tonight. And I think that's reflected in, in some of the data we see more generally about attendance as well. Um, so it is a real challenge. And I think next year, uh, what that looks like and how to support students academically and social emotionally is going to be um, a different challenge that we have, but no less large, you know, than the challenges that we've faced this year, because we know there's been huge impacts uh, on many students and many families in our community. So a uh, related question, uh, good se segue, you teed me up there, Dr. Morris. Um, uh, there are a lot of questions about mental health and how to best support students' uh, mental health needs. Uh, I, I won't read everyone, but the, the general um, theme is um, how do we help students who, uh, first, how do we identify those students, given that they're remote? 
Um, and how, so how do we support them in the remote setting? Um, and then um, as we do transition back to in-person um, and students have had the, um, are coming with, with the increased frequency of, of mental health needs, what are we doing to prepare for that? What is the, um, what is the thinking in terms of, you know, the immediate return starts next month uh, and, and, and longer term as, as we help kids um, recover from the pandemic? Yeah, so I think in the short run, I mean, our counselors are still connecting with families and students routinely. Uh, we have a grant for supporting students' uh, emotional needs, we're working with River Valley um, Counseling, and it's, we have additional resources this year, and we're using them both to work directly with students and also be planning for next year in the way that, that, that the question described. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're working on finalizing a screening tool to best understand uh, at a broad level how our students are doing and what challenges they uh, are experiencing. And, you know, I think here's what I'd say is that even if we're in, you know, I hear a lot of concerns or questions about being in person in the fall and right, I understand those and I think we'll be in a different place in the fall. Um, but we're, we're not planning to go back to the same place we were in prior. Um, it's not uh, pretending that this year didn't exist is not going to be an effective strategy because regardless of in-person now or not in-person, our students, all of us have not had a normal existence uh, since March of last year. And so, you know, simple relational pieces or aspects of our work is gonna need to be really centering in how we approach the beginning of the school and how we approach the school year. I've had fascinating discussions this week actually with um, some elementary faculty members. We had some optional meetings to talk about start time. And one of the things I continue to hear from our educators is, can we rethink the beginning of the day? particularly as we head to next year, can we think about how to start the day in a way that development is appropriate, that we're reteaching some social skills, understanding that students have had a traumatic experience over the course of the, uh, of, of the pandemic. And so that's the type of thinking that our educators are doing about how to support students. And, and I really like the focus at the beginning of the day uh, because we know that you know the hustle and bustle of just getting to a classroom is not gonna be sufficient uh, for students feeling enveloped uh, into the school, back back into the school environment. Um, and we also know there's going to be a lot of fearfulness uh, on the part of students. As much as students want to be back, and we, ex we saw this in October, um, even if they're excited to be back, they hadn't been in an sp indoor space with other people in months and months and months. And it's going to be an even longer period potentially uh, for students coming back in the fall. So uh, we are going to have to do professional development and the beginning of the year has to look different next year uh, to support students um, social emotional needs. Um, and the biggest thing we can do is to support, to prioritize setting a strong school culture and classroom community uh, and showing that students are valued and understanding that we're gonna see some different behaviors uh, and different relationships form uh, because of what happened to uh, this year and what happened during a pandemic. Thank you. Um, so I see a uh, hand is up uh, as a speaker. So, um... Uh, Keith McFarland, um, please unmute yourself and you have uh, three minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me now? All right, so my name is Keith McFarland. I am a teacher at the high school. I'm also a sitting school, uh, school community member in Sunderland, next town over and at Frontier Regional. Uh, I went through uh, the difficult decision that you all had to go through. Uh, I chose when we were going forward with a hybrid model because I felt it served the most people. But those students and staff that did not feel comfortable could go remote, but at the same time, I wanted to respect the people that wanted to try to come in the building, both students and staff. Uh, we have been successful in doing that. We started off with metrics and had to revise them, saw quickly that they were, um, they didn't really register exactly what was going on. We found that the school did not exactly mirror the district. Um, but we've also found that it's not without risk. We have had students get ill. We have had staff get ill. So it is not without risk. It's also not an exact panacea because the classroom is very different than a normal one. Students will be masked. They will not be working in groups. They will be in cohorts. They will be socially distant. Um, some of them won't have teachers. Some of them, some of their teachers will be remote. So it's going to be very different. It's so not an exact answer, but it can be done. So I have urged the union to, uh, negotiate with the school committee to look at the metrics again. 
I, I've, I've, quite honestly, I've had a little frustration that, that there hasn't been communication. Uh, one of the things that I think has been the hallmark of both in Sunderland and Deerfield is that we've had a lot of communication and good communication, constant communication. Uh, I appreciate the school committee and the hard work. I know exactly the position you've been in, but I am critical of the decision to ask for volunteers. I think that that is asking me as a teacher to violate a contractually negotiated contract. And so for me, it comes down to the MOA. I'm going to continue urging the union to come to the table and to, to talk about the contract, especially, I'm sorry, the MOA, especially considering as we get closer to warmer weather, vaccinations happen. I am really hopeful that in my mind, especially post April vacation, that we can come back and that we can have students in some way in the building. So I would ask, I hope that the school committee and the union can really work towards um, communication, effective communication and communication can, and that can get something done. So I do appreciate your hard work. Um, and I and all the other teachers are going to continue doing what we can to, to try to do the best thing we can for our students this year and hopefully next year as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so a few uh, lower level detail questions. Um, uh, uh, couldn't, uh, from Sally Fitz, um, sports are able to occur, which is wonderful. Couldn't clubs happen outdoors well? What other plans or ideas are in place to connect students and families even if in-person classes don't happen before next uh, next school year, thank you. Um, there was also a somewhat related question about uh, tents, and will um, as the weather gets better, will tents allow us to have more outdoor activity, uh, whether or not schools uh, classes are in person or remote? Um, Dr. Morris, I don't know if you can speak to that. Yep, so tents will be back up when the weather allows. Um, you know, the poles are still there, um, and you know it's. Um, New England weather is hard to predict, um, but in springtime, uh, we'll work to get those back up. Uh, I think the, the clubs and some of those pieces, definitely um, I've heard that feedback and, you know, depending which teachers opt to return to in-person, there may be some possibilities there. And that's some of the feedback we're gathering as we get the survey results and try to put together what we're able to, to support students to uh, in-person instruction for students to the degree to which we are able, we can. Thank you. Um, just another reminder, uh, if any attendee would like to speak, uh, just raise your hand. Um, the, uh, there was a question on, um, will, this, will the school committee change its, its decision to force uh, students who have school choice into the elementary to go into the lottery for the regional? Um, and I just wanted to clarify that that's not a school committee decision. There's a state law that changed recently um, that affects um, the uh, students who have choiced in at the kindergarten first grade level in the last couple of years, that when they eventually get to the to the region, they're not automatically um, uh, accepted into the, the choice program. Um, that is something that we are have uh, explored advocacy with with our uh, state local rep um, because uh, we've the, the few discussions we've had about it, we've we've expressed support for the fact that we want to accept those students, um, but we're, we're not legally allowed to because of the school choice program and the state regulations there. Um, so just a brief clarification there. Um, um, I am going to go through these kind of one at a time. Um, can someone specifically address the needs of children with IEPs who require services to access the curriculum? I would like to see some sort of plan that prioritizes their needs. Um, so um, tomorrow morning, actually, Dr. Marsh will be joining us at the CPAC meeting, Special Ed Parent Advisory Council, uh, which is public meeting open at nine o'clock. Um, any kind of question can be directed at that time. Um, you can also reach out to CPAC at arps.org for support for special education. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, Dr. Morris, about IEPs and, and how those are, are affected by the, the remote and the in-person transition. Yeah, I think the it's something that, you know, the CPAC representative spoke to, I think, quite eloquently tonight. Um, it's not the first time, as she noted, that um, CPAC has made a statement on that. I encourage, you know, about tomorrow morning, like you said. I think at a broader level, um, you know, I think getting in touch with the liaison um, for, parent, for families is the recommendation I'd make. I think we, you know, we've made a lot of progress. I think last year's summer school, which was virtual, uh, our special ed staff who worked it found out a lot about what worked and what didn't. Um, 
in, in much different ways than we did, you know, last spring. So I think being in touch with any concerns with the liaison and being able to talk through what accommodations are working and not working uh, in a virtual context is, is, is the first step that I would take to recommend. All right, so um, I, I, I guess I just wanted to ask the panelists uh, for a time check. Uh, so we're approaching two and a half hours. Um, we have about half of our attendees uh, remaining from our high watermark. Um, I've been through most of the, um, the, the batch questions. I know I have not gotten to every question and we have made a commitment that if we do not get to a question, I'm, I'm sure that I'm just going to logistically by mistake overlook a question uh, that we will publish uh, answers to that. Um, so, um, uh, yes, um, Ms. McDonald. Yep. Um, I, the, I, I do believe that most of the questions have been addressed in some form or another. And, and so we will be publishing these afterwards. There is, a, there is one question about um, regarding uh, the, uh, uh, excuse me, um, the school committee, I assume, is um, asking when it says, "Can you, can you, the school committee, please make a commitment to engage in conversations again?" I believe that that that's suggesting with the union, um, and the answer is yes. Um, we will. Um, we had um, really productive, informal conversations in um, in January. The three conversations they started out um, tough, um, but everybody showed up and we ended, um, with the third one, I think in a really good spot and a commitment to continue the collaboration and conversation. Um, and just as an aside, you know, the, the informal conversation continues in email, um, and just collaborative working, um, throughout. So yes, um, we will continue to commit to engaging in conversations with the APA. Yeah, so I, I'm just um, going through for related questions. Um, uh, earlier question from Kyle Broders was similar. What will be the process and timeline for creating a new agreement with the APEA for the 2021-2022 school year? Um, I think it's referring to the fact that uh, not only does the main contract, the APEA expire, uh, but the MOA also expires uh, this academic year at the end of June. Uh, will the deliberations be public? Will they be open to input from families and community members? Um, I think most, most we can say right now is that that's to be determined. Um, and I guess the, the only other detail I'd add on continued conversations is that, um, you know, the, the informal online meetings we've been having um, are specifically uh, not about changing the, the, the MOA. If, if, if we were to have a meeting about um, changing the MOA, that would have to be agreed upon by both parties. And, and as, as, as we know, that hasn't we haven't gotten to that point yet where both parties have agreed to to talk about changing it. Um, so we can make um, one one last call. So um, last call for raised hands for any any speaker comments um, and any um, questions um, that are remaining here. We will follow up um, with a, a published uh, question document. Dr. Morris. Yeah, there's one about lunches. Um, that's a logistical one that I can answer. There's a, a question that talked about can, can students eat outside? And that was the way that we tried to do it as much as possible for when students were in. That's in our plan. Uh, the reality is it's not always possible to eat outside in New England, um, eat lunch outside in New England. So as much as possible, absolutely. Uh, and we follow all the recommendations around public health um, that we have. The reality is with our class size and our room size, um, we can easily have students, you know, um, pretty far apart as they're eating. Uh, the optimal is certainly outside from a health perspective. I agree with that. And but it's just, you know, if it's 40 degrees and raining, um, it's just not quite possible to have students be eating outside. So um, it's a great question. Uh, the answer is as much as possible, and um, but we can't guarantee every day. Uh, Dr. Morris, a logistical question about the um, volunteer return process. Um, when will you inform families of in-person possibilities, depending on the survey results? I, I think it refers to depending on the staff survey results. Right, right, right. Um, many families will need to plan and will need at least a few weeks. It would be very helpful to communicate this before February vacation. Yeah, the goal that's that we of, have- Sorry, that's from Jasmine Kerasi. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the goal is as soon as possible to compile all the information and ask for interest uh, about return. Uh, and our goal is, you know, I'm not sure before the February vacation, but certainly during the February vacation to uh, have outreach 
to families um, where there are seats to ex see if they express interest in returning to in-person. Um, uh, another planning question from Ariella Schwell. Is there a conversation happening about in-person summer school, assuming all teachers are vaccinated by then? Um, so I would just, I would leave off the last part, um, just say there is a conversation happening about in-person summer school. Um, as it relates to the vaccinations, I think I wanna be really clear that um, at the current time, we have not, uh, it's unclear whether we even could or would, but uh, I just say this differently. Uh, vaccines aren't mandated for employment right now. So uh, I want to be really clear that while I think many or most, um, and that's what I hear, teachers are interested in vaccines, I, I can't pledge that every teacher or any educator uh, or every staff person uh, who will be back in the fall will be vaccinated, not necessarily because of supply, um, but I, I don't want people to, to believe that um, we'll necessarily be at 100%. I mean, as people who work in hospital settings and other settings know, um, they're not at 100% either, um, even in a setting that um, is there for sick people primarily. Um, so, uh, you know, I just, I can't guarantee the that everyone, you know, there's a lot of language, not necessarily in that question, but in other questions about that everyone's going to get vaccinated. And that's not something that um, I can say will definitely occur. Um, one last uh, thought before we um, start to wrap up. Um, if there, uh, once you publish the, 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 response document to question, answers to questions that weren't answered. Uh, if someone reads that and still finds that they feel their, their question wasn't answered, what's, what's their best follow-up method? So my well, recommend, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. No, I would, I, my um, recommendation um, would be to, um, to submit public comment um, for, uh, to, to an upcoming uh, school committee meeting, send an email to school committee at arps.org and, um, or if it's, um, and or uh, to Dr. Morris um, and what Morris M at arpus.org. Um, Dr. I know Morris. We're trying to wrap up. Could I just answer? There's one or two, I think, that are pretty quick and logistical. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, has there been discussion of pool testing in classrooms? We were a district that applied and were accepted into the state's pool testing system. Uh, that only covers us for the next six weeks or so. Uh, at that point, we could decide whether we want to opt in, which there's a, a financial cost uh, to the district. The state's only covering it through mid-March, but we were accepted for both Amherst and the region. Uh, and we'll, you know, see how it's used and implemented. But, you know, we think, you know, at the current time, it's worth exploring and our application is expected. And we have a webinar, you know, about implementation coming soon. So um, we appreciate the state support. We wish it was going on longer than to mid-March, frankly, but uh, we're going to take what we can get from that and see how it goes um, moving forward. Great. If there's, um, and I'm just going to look also at the uh, school committee members, if they've seen any questions that they would like to answer. I feel like they've answered a lot. Um, and I'm not seeing any more uh, raised hands for speakers. I'm going to pause momentarily. I'm seeing none. Um, so I will um, actually uh, move us to adjourn. And as, um, as, as we've said multiple times, we'll follow up with um, published um, document with these questions. Um, this meeting um, was recorded. And um, so we will also post the recording of this meeting um, on, on our Amherst School Committee website. Um, so I am going to make a motion that we adjourn this meeting of the Amherst School Committee. Is there a second? Second. And we will move to a roll call vote. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, I and McDonald, I, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. <laughs>